speakers during the meeting. I will ask them. During the meeting, I will ask the people speaking identify themselves before speaking so the commissioners and members of the public will know who is talking and have the same knowledge as those of us here present in the room. All commissioners are unmuted and may speak. The public and most staff should self-mute and may not speak unless recognized by the chair. Due to the possibility of background noise, I ask that commissioners and presenters mute their electronic devices when they're not speaking. As previously stated, the MHCC posts documents that will be acted on or discussed at least a day in advance so that members of the public will have time to download them before the meeting begins. We will continue to provide advance notice of how to register for and dial into the meeting by posting that information on the homepage of the commission's website and on our various social media channels. So we'll now call the roll. Uh, Dr. Commissioner Bendari, I see you. I see you there. Commissioner Boyer. Commissioner, come back to Commissioner Boyer. Commissioner Boyle, I see you're present in the room. Commissioner Brumbot. I see Commissioner Brzezinski is here present in the room. As is Commissioner Dorton. Commissioner Metz, I can see you on camera. Welcome. And Commissioner O'Connor. I see Commissioner O'Grady. Uh, Commissioner Ojikutu. Commissioner Wang is here present in the room. And Commissioner Wood, I can see you on camera. Welcome. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. We have enough folks for a quorum. Five here and four on the line. Very good. Nine. Great. Well, thanks. With that, we will turn to agenda item number one, approval of the minutes. Always a hot topic. Included in your packets are copies of the minutes from the October 2022 public meeting of the commission that took place in person and by video conference. I want to thank Commissioner Chair for uh, Commissioner Wang for his excellent job filling in as chair. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the October Commission meeting. Motion to approve. I have a second. Second. Commissioner Wazinski uh, made the motion, <laughs> and Commissioner Wang made has seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Minutes are approved. Agenda item two. Commissioners uh, have received. Chairman, this is Dr. Bandari. Yes, sir. I think I I logged on probably a little later. I just want to say I'm here also. If I didn't say I'm present. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. We we have you on the, uh, as present on the. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you for your kindness. Commissioners have received written updates from our centers. Commissioners, do you have any questions on the written updates? Does the executive director any I updates? I have one. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Boyle. Uh, I'm just going, I'm, I'm a broken record, but uh, I'm just pointing out, as I always do, that there are at least two in this case, um, this other one, of um, uh, nursing homes that ha have been um, being purchased by uh, outside uh, companies that would not um, qualify for a CLN because of their star ratings and because of their uh, experience in, in other areas. And uh, just a reminder, these are our most vulnerable people. Um, and perhaps uh, because of purchase, perhaps uh, these companies come in, we question um, really go through CLN successfully. Just to support a commission one point, one star out of five, not even two stars. These are folks with one star out of five. So might be worth knowing. So, uh, you know, first, you know, I, I think the staff is you know, in agreement that that their uh, recent mode of, of entering the Maryland market is not through a CON application but rather to acquisitions. Historically, acquisitions have not uh, been uh, viewed as subject to CON. 
except with the qualification when the new owner plans to make substantial uh, modifications, which would change the uh, the nature, the scope of services delivered at the facility. Um, we have revised the application um, recognition that our authority is quite limited, uh, minimally to gather facts about the purchaser uh, and their previous ex experience. Uh, there is, we do have some uh, ability to, um, if, if there are significant criminal or civil uh, violations, we can uh, take uh, some action that typically um, what we're seeing in current purchasers does not rise to that situation. It's more uh, less than less than satisfactory performance. It's uh, the trigger. Uh, I know that there are others in the state that are concerned about this. We did have a, a meeting uh, earlier this month with the uh, service employee uh, international union, which would be representing um, um, employees of nursing homes and other healthcare facilities. Uh, they did raise questions about uh, about perhaps uh, providing some more um, impact to, to MHCC's assessments um, to require others to use what we found as a guide in considering uh, licensure application. We have not seen any proposed legislation. We would naturally bring that to the commission. Uh, but I did want to ask Paul if there's anything more we can add. Um, certainly the method of, 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 act of expansion today is through purchase, not through um, construction. Uh, I don't know if you have any more to add on that or not, Paul. Uh, no, we, uh, we really don't have any role to play within the scope of CON regulation on <clears throat> acquisitions of healthcare facilities, changes of ownership of healthcare facilities. Uh, they are expressly not within the scope of CON, and they are required to notify us uh, before um, an actual closure a transaction to acquire a facility, uh, which they do. And as Ben has uh, mentioned, we have beefed up the type of information that we request for purchasers of healthcare facilities. Um, and uh, a few months ago, uh, earlier this year, we could start um, including in our monthly updates more detail on what we find out um, of research in this area. You can see, I read it. Yes. Until December 6th. We have in our, in our last iteration of the state health plan, the nursing home chapter, we did include, um, um, as, as Ben also mentioned, uh, a review of the uh, instances of Medicare or Medicaid fraud. Yep. <laughs> of these entities that are purchasing. As, he, as of yet, that's kind of an untested uh, regulatory stance that we've taken. Um, but we have said in those cases, uh, we would not uh, accept that uh, notice of acquisition as a valid notice of acquisition. I'm not sure that we could get away with that. Really stop uh, because, you know, you're. In any, in all these cases, you're not just saying no to someone who wants to purchase a facility, but you're also stopping a sale of a facility by someone who is you know, trying to sell an asset. So it's, uh, I think, um, certainly want to uh, monitor what sort of legislative proposals uh, forward. Talk with the legislature about the desirability perhaps enhancing uh, our role in reviewing acquisitions. Um, I would say that personally, I think, you know, it, the state really wants to take serious action in this area. I'm not sure that the Maryland Healthcare Commission would be the most uh, direct agency to turn to for that. I would think that licensure, um, since you would have to basically 
transfer the license of the facility to the new owner, um, that might be a more uh, appropriate agency in which to have regulatory authority to stop acquisitions uh, by persons who we, we actually do not want to come into Maryland, operate facilities because of a bad track record. But if we could change our authority, we could be another um, bulwark against this happening and then licensure could do a better job as well. I, I question future discussions of both. Could um, we have data now and it's uh, informing our perspective as our role for consumer advocacy, could we you know, bring this forward to, you know, reports to the incoming uh, administration or our reports to uh, legislature or so forth, just saying this is an observation we have and perhaps something that could uh, benefit from further, you know, oversight, since this seems to be a bit of a, in some ways a loophole that lower quality facilities are entering a market and bypassing, um, you know, standards which are set to protect consumers and patients. So then you send a loved one to somewhere that comes into our state, one star out of five, that's who would want to send a loved one there? Is there anything we can do, Paul, right between now and the next meeting that as a commission to, to advocate for this? So I have a suggestion. It may make sense, we have our January retreat coming. Yes. We, Table this, but one of the things we could think about is a work group so that not a quorum of the commissioners can can walk through the different alternatives and come back and that way present the whole commission with the menu of things that we that the commission might be able to do, might not be able to do, or whether authority is needed. Like there's a it's a broad ranging discussion that probably we can't hold it well, but a small group that's not the, you know less than half the commission that's that's could work on this informally. So why don't we table it until January? Yeah, I think you have three potential members right here. It sounds like it. It doesn't sound like it'll be that hard to find. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I might add that um, I think it's important to, to maybe talk a little further in December before the, uh, the retreat. Uh, if the commission was to come forward with the legislation um, ourselves, there is an executive branch protocol that we've given you a sample of. Governor Hogan's policies uh, can still apply, but the, the legislative office in the office of the governor typically wants heads up um, well in advance of when it's introduced. Given there's a change of administrations, we probably would have some flex ability if we thought we wanted to move forward. You know, MHCC specific legislation, which you know, those of you who've been around for a while, we do occasionally do that um, and not, you know, not rely on stakeholders. But we'd have to move quickly after the start of the session. Um, usually that first year, things are pretty much um, you know, open uh, and in terms of how they want to do things. Um, clearance would be necessary. From I'm going to need a new job. What is going on? Is that just me? I'm sorry, who is that? And if you're not a commissioner, can you put yourself on mute? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Matt. Uh, yeah, obviously I have some expertise in this area. I'd be interested in serving any capacity in a small group. Um, you know, a couple of things to think about is, I mean, the current process involves relatively um, benign overview through the CON process as far as a sale. Uh, and then also the um, Office of Healthcare Quality, as far as um, as they're concerned, as we go through here, there's not much um, in-depth oversight that I could tell during the sale process. Um, I mean, it is a concern, um, a valid concern going forward with um, uh, operators uh, entering the Maryland market. Um, I guess it would be it would be uh, something to explore um, and research as far as um, how you would, um, I don't wanna say exclude or vet, how you would vet a potential um, 
new entity entering the Maryland market or purchasing facilities uh, and take a look at their previous experience. Many of these operators come from, um, you know, out of state markets uh, that have uh, same federal regulations, but some substantial differences in their state regulation um, when they enter our market. Uh, the biggest thing that drives entry into the Maryland market still is, is, is twofold. Uh, it's uh, reasonably, uh, reasonably uh, well or better funded um, uh, Medicaid dollars as compared to surrounding states, but um, more uh, specifically, it's uh, Maryland uh, has the lowest penetration of managed Medicare in the nation. Which which makes for an attractive uh, market to invest in. Um, so, uh, it's I think it's a good idea or a, a good approach to take a look at a small work group to come up with some different ideas for that. And I don't think it's just going to involve uh, MHCC. It's going to in, involve other licensing authority, uh, if that all makes sense. It does. It does, and it's a complicated area, which is why I suggest a small group so that um, those different pieces can be thought about. Yes. Excellent. Yes, I do. It's true. It's true. Go ahead, Mr. Commissioner Dorton. One last comment, um, and Commissioner Metz might disagree with me, but I, <clears throat> having known enough to be dangerous, perhaps. There are there is significant controversy, perhaps about what one star versus two stars versus three stars. There is some <clears throat> folks who think there's subjectivity, etc., in in how we rate things. So I think that's important, also as a consideration for a subcommittee, uh, as to we really appreciate what stars mean. Um, and the significance of one versus, that's unacceptable in somebody's eyes versus three, that is. Jeff, am, am I totally off on that? No, you're not. I mean, there are some subjectivity in, in different things as far as, I mean, our facilities uh, typically a five star, or sometimes four star, depending upon the uh, quality metrics or the type of residents we're serving. Of course, there's, there is a great difference between one star and three star, but uh, it is, it's, it's, it's difficult uh, to just, just uh, go by that rating type of system um, and, and determine overall quality of a facility. It's just one way that we can take a look at, at, at uh, quality of facility. So, um, I, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I think um, you're correct. It seems to me from the nature of our discussion, we have concern about a degradation in the quality of facilities. I think that the spirit of this is we do not want to see facilities change ownership and have a decline in their quality indicators, whether we, you know, whatever our perspective is on those indicators. I know nursing homes are highly regulated and evaluated, but, you know, the spirit I think of MHCC here is from my perspective is we would like to preserve the quality that it exists and see it maintained or improved, regardless what the measure is. I think it makes sense. Uh, here in a lot of interest to the commissioners of figuring out what the next step would be, whether it's something we can do or something we want to propose for someone else to do or you know, all others. So, is that Ben, do you have any updates? So, yeah, I have a few things, we just a quick uh, run through of them. I think we'll take the, what we've heard. Uh, in the, uh, into uh, operation. Uh, I think I had uh, four names. We could have up to, up to seven uh, participants. So of commissioners that are interested uh, who have not spoken, uh, if you could reach out to me, that'd be helpful. We'll try to uh, convene uh, a meeting um, before December moves too far along. In terms of uh, just a couple of points today, uh, you'll hear it from David uh, as well. And that is that we do have a number of, of legislative reports that are gonna be presented today. Uh, we completed them uh, and have, have uh, will be soliciting comments uh, over the next week. Uh, what our plan is 
to do with these reports is to add stakeholder comments um, as an appendices to these reports. We're not uh, going back, uh, at least I have a strong intent on what we're presenting to you as final, but we are putting in, if we haven't gotten any, we haven't gotten a whole lot of comments. I submitted uh, several today, uh, which you may not have seen, but uh, we would put those in the uh, appendix to the report. Uh, if that's acceptable to everyone, I, I think we have a good idea of the, what the range of comments would be. And if we do believe we've addressed the major issues in the respective telehealth report and the first mandate study report that are, you're going to hear today, but that would allow us to meet the report deadlines, which are December 1st. We can't bring these reports back uh, and meet the deadlines. And so I'd like to get that, you know, that's acceptable to everyone. Naturally, if there's a, a significant flaw, error, or question, we would have to modify that. But I'm thinking that's not likely to be the case. Um, then you know, jumping into the work groups themselves, just in terms of where they are uh, and deadlines, uh, the commission had volunteered to help Secretary Schrader run a work group on health worker workplace violence to develop a, uh, a public campaign to raise public awareness. Uh, that's been uh, run under the direction of, of uh, Dr. Ike and uh, Teresa Lee here on the, here on the staff. The third meeting was completed last night and they've come up with a set of recommendations um, to uh, put forward in a written report. Um, we will bring that to the commission in, uh, in December. Uh, that's something we, can, we weren't required to do, but we helped the secretary out. Um, work groups that we are actively working on that don't have a reporting requirement here in uh, December include the a work group on the oversight of assisted uh, living facilities with 10 or fewer beds. The first meeting got started uh, just last week uh, and the next meeting on December 5th will focus on uh, input from, from other regulatory entities, the Office of Healthcare Quality and Department of Aging on the scope of their oversight. Naturally, uh, small facilities are a big uh, question. And, uh, there are more than 1,200 of them operating in the state. Uh, while they are subject to some oversight, uh, there is concern you know, about getting exactly right too much, too little. Uh, and certainly the pandemic uh, challenges as it relates to inspections have, have had to be scaled back by OHCQ. So that's you know, raised some additional questions. Uh, the final report for that is not due until 2023. We have some time, but we want to get started with that. We don't have a commissioner uh, participating on that group. Um, naturally, if you uh, want to participate uh, over the course of the um, work group's lifespan, uh, let me know. Um, the the uh, next group is the palliative care work group. That was uh, a major uh, uh, interest of the uh, hospice network and other uh, End of life providers. Uh, we're underway with that. It's agreed to on the definition of palliative care. Uh, there are issues that relate to who's who's providing these services, uh, the scope of, the, of of palliative care services that are offered, and probably most importantly, who's, who and how it's being reimbursed. Uh, that need to be sorted out. Um, the, Interest is we have really strong interest in this work group. Again, we don't have a commissioner participating, uh, given the chair's your preference. If we did, that would be great. Still early enough, if commissioners want to join, um, I think there would be a, be a benefit to that endeavor. Um, right now, we're planning the big next big activity for the for the uh, to assess. Uh, capability, scope, perspectives, is we do plan to launch it. Uh, a survey, we have not yet identified a contractor, but they would uh, administer a, uh, a survey that the work group has helped us develop by questions, although they are primarily uh, uh, open book questions, not, not multiple choice. So I think 
you know, how we actually administer it will be a little bit tricky, but um, we've concluded that given the nature of information we need, a lot of it's going to be subjective and qualitative rather than you know, quality, quantitative um, uh, responses, but it will be helpful. The primary care uh, work group created by legislation last session also uh, kicked off this past week uh, with uh, very strong attendance. This was more of an organizational meeting. Uh, we do have um, Commissioner Cheatham uh, attending uh, as a commissioner representative in that group. We have contracted with Friedman uh, Healthcare to help us uh, support uh, facilitating the work group and also to provide uh, perspectives on their experience of working with other states setting um, uh, primary care funding levels uh, through, uh, through changes in the insurance statute in those respective <laughs> states um, to further primary care. Uh, I'm not prepared to say that it's the formula we'll take here in Maryland. We do. We operate under a slightly different uh, or significantly different regime, depending on your perspective. And we have a total cost of care overall budget, uh, how this uh, a sub budget for primary care might work. Something we'll have to work out, uh, but it's going to be a you know, interesting um, endeavor moving forward. Um, I think some people think we already have the answer, which is to say, you know, setting set a budget level for primary care and have us get done with it. But we our aim is to get as much perspective, not only from primary care uh, providers who are essential in this process and are well represented, but also purchasers. Um, as uh, we have several employers as well as consumers, um, um, in terms of their views, and of course payers will weigh in as well. Um, so uh, look forward to that continuing. Uh, stick, sticking with primary care, our next meeting of our Maryland primary care uh, work group will be, uh, will be in early January. Uh, what we're waiting for uh, most anxiously is what uh, CMMI, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, is gonna tell us about how many practices of the nearly 500 practices that are participating are gonna be eligible for the the next phase, which is track three, which is a, um, a, a two-sided risk um, model. I, there may be some people who would be uh, calling it two-sided risk, but it's definitely uh, adds, adds more risk as well as potentially uh, some additional rewards uh, to the formula. We expect about 100 practices, uh, either because they're required under the conditions uh, in the agreements that they signed back in 2018 or 19 to, to be admitted in track three, or because they voluntarily want to be in, uh, to join in, in uh, 2023, the first year of track three. Um, and the advisory council uh, will have some preliminary information, as well as beginning to talk about what's happened, what's going to happen um, with this program as we move into the next phase of the total cost of care model. Um, I'd like that refresher 101. This is Dr. Booker. Thank you, everyone. Great presentation. I'm sorry, we, we are getting some feedback yeah, from. Aaron. Okay. All right. Uh, the next brief update is on, uh, on our non uh, CDS, non controlled. Uh, um, Dangerous substance, non controlled dangerous substance work group. Um, and that's a major endeavor because it's going to focus on enabling uh, dispensers to share uh, prescribing information with, um, with uh, direct care providers um, or additional care management um, clinical operations. Um, this was something that was considered several years ago. It passed last year. Um, it gives uh, uh, Chris, the authority to assemble this uh, with MHCC developing regulations. Um, we have convened a work group to study this issue uh, and to begin to develop a pilot program for dispensers to participate in a slow rollout of this effort. Uh, in conjunction with this, uh, we uh, know that, that uh, CRISP is developing the RFP to identify a vendor to help uh, 
uh, operate the data capture side of the dispensing information from the, the, um, the drug industry. Uh, that has not hit the streets yet, but we believe it will be by the end of the year. And it will be a major um, you know, next step in enriching the amount of clinical information um, clinic, uh, clinicians of, of all type, principally physicians, but others as well, would have in terms of understanding um, the medications taken by the Maryland patients. Uh, the last point. Okay. One quick question. Does this include like methadone dispensed by addiction treatment centers? So methadone would be already um, would already through flow through the PDMP system. It does not. It does not. It doesn't currently flow through PDMP. No, it does not. Which clinically is a major problem because it's a very dangerous, powerful opioid that interacts with a lot of the medication that is absent on the PDMP. So, so well, well, that's you know that's something uh, to do. Uh, issue for the uh, work group to determine how that actually is rolled out. But the, the, the vision is that uh, controlled dangerous substance information does already flow through to Chris. Uh, this augments it, but actually uh, significantly expands because uh, controlled substances are a relatively small portion of the prescription drug uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, what we're now adding is not not for CDS oversight, but to support clinicians uh, in the work that they do. So um, I think it's you know, something that we realize um, has to be done pretty thoughtfully. This is well to come into play, but I, I think we want to get started with that, and we're pushing Chris forward as well as working to. Um, to um, identify early uh, pioneers for the center. Uh, the, I just wanted lastly to bring uh, you, uh, make you aware that uh, in budget language uh, in, the, uh, in the last year, last session of the legislature, we were directed to uh, conduct a study of the financial requirements for access to organ transplants. Uh, the several legislators say, had been concerned that they thought um, that access to organs was uh, unfairly limited to those um, with uh, very limited uh, financial resources. Uh, we've conducted interviews with the three systems that offer transplants to Maryland residents uh, here, in, here in the state, Hopkins, uh, University of Maryland, and MedStar. Our plan is, to, is that we're nearing completion of that report. It was actually due, we're gonna ask for an extension so we can, uh, based on just information I've gotten, uh, bring it back to the commission in, in uh, December. I had initially thought uh, we would try to get it done, uh, have, it done have it presented today, we couldn't do that. Uh, and given that we've already missed the deadline, um, it's probably best given it. It will be a controversial issue next session as well. But make sure you see the report before we do this, um, before we submit it to the legislature. It's a descriptive report, but it's an issue that I think is going to resurrect itself uh, again in legislation in the coming session. Uh, lastly, just wanted to bring your attention that um, Leapfrog, uh, the hospital quality reporting. Uh, organization did release its last, its latest results for fall of 2023. And uh, in general, results for Maryland were you know, pretty strong. We had, uh, we've had um, so eight hospitals receive uh, scores of eight. It's, it's an increase of one from uh, the spring of 2022. Uh, and you know, they included a uh, double AMC, Luminous Health, Garrett, Mercy, uh, University of Maryland, at Easton, among others. Uh, and you know, notably, we do have more um, uh, C hospitals than the distribution nationally. Uh, we, have, we have no Fs and we only have one D, a hospital in the state. So performance in Maryland hospitals 
pretty strong. Uh, naturally, uh, we'd like to see see uh, more A's uh, than we do, but uh, it's consistent. It, and this entire effort was one that was originally uh, created by MHCC, was a support of Lee Frogham five or six years ago. Maryland hospitals historically had not reported uh, and work that we've done here uh, enabled them to do that. So um, again, another quality system. Uh, it's incorporated into our own reporting systems uh, and we also make it available um, in its natural environment through leapfrog and rate to make sure as commissioners know um, that performance is um, steady to slightly improve. That concludes what I wanted to share with you. Uh, happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? I have one on leapfrog. I, I think it will get to see the report sooner, uh, eventually. I actually will make that available to you. I have I have a court in summary uh, that I'll send out to all the commissioners in terms of performance uh, after this meeting. Do they address whether there's any uh, a discontinuity uh, because of COVID, for example, you know, the healthcare services shifted so much to emergency and less of other things in 2020 and then came right back the opposite direction in 2021. Did that affect? So with, I, I don't want to jump say too much. So I haven't looked at it in that detail. The answer would be that we'll be able to look at any impact. Uh, keep in mind that the leapfrog scores, although they're stated as for seven, fall of 2022, actually reflect performance uh, for the first part of 2022 and the latter part of 2021, or in some instances for all of 2021. So we were pretty much in the height of, right. of the pandemic in 2021, for sure. That makes sense. There are no other questions. I'll read the speech about action items. Before we consider action items today, I want to remind commissioners that if they wish to recuse themselves on any action item, they should inform the chair. For commissioners who are participating remotely, who decide to recuse, whose desire to recuse themselves, they should remain silent, turn off their cameras, and mute their phones. Commissioners in room 100, who are recused should move to the small conference room. That will turn to agenda item number three, benchmarks for pre-authorization of healthcare services. OMAR 1025-17, benchmarks, benchmarks for pre-authorization of healthcare services requires payers to implement the electronic pre-authorization process. A series of four benchmarks, commissioners approved for public comment, proposed amendments to the regulations at the July 21st commission meeting. The proposed amendments were published in the Maryland Register on September 9th, for 30 day formal comment period. Justine Springer, Program Manager, Health Information Technology, will present the amendments for final action. Justine, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in 2012, Maryland became one of the first states to pass legislation to help simplify the pre-authorization process, which historically relied upon telephone, fax, and paper-based communications. The law aimed to create administrative efficiencies in the pre-authorization process. This included establishing online systems to receive and track electronic pre-authorization requests. Next slide, please. The law required MHCC to work with payers to implement an electronic pre-authorization process in a phased approach and report on their attainment of four benchmarks through 2016. <clears throat> the benchmarks and implementation timeline uh, for each are listed on this slide. Next slide, please. Uh, by 2015, the largest payers operating in the state had implemented all four benchmarks. Seven payers currently have a waiver from the benchmarks, which is permitted in law for extenuating circumstances. Uh, six of the payers have premium volume that falls below 1 million annually, and one is a group, HM, group model HMO. Uh, the seven payers are listed in the appendices of the materials that were sent to commissioners. Next slide, please. The proposed amendments seek to reduce administrative activities for payers that remain in a waiver status by extending the waiver period from two to five years. The amendments also clarify that payers in a waiver status must notify MHCC within 30 days if there is a change in the extenuating circumstances for which the waiver was issued, as well as a process for withdrawal of a waiver by MHCC. 
Uh, other miscellaneous changes included uh, removing the past compliant date for the fourth benchmark. Next slide, please. As a reminder, staff first presented informal draft amendments to the commission on April 21st, which were then released for, to the public for a three week informal comment period. Comments were received from the Maryland Department of Aging and the Legal Action Center. The Maryland Department of Aging recommended clarifying the process for a payer to request review of a denial or withdrawal of a waiver and staff made changes to section 0.05 E of the regulation. Changes requested by the Legal Action Center as it relates to compliance with the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act were deemed to be beyond the scope of MHCC's regulatory authority. These changes were brought back to the Commission on July 21st for approval to be released for formal comment. Next slide, please. On September 9th, the proposed amendments were released for a 30-day formal comment period. One joint comment endorsed by MedCAI, the Maryland State Medical Society, Maryland Community Health System, Maryland Nurses Association, American College of Nurse Midwives, the Maryland Affiliate, and the Mid-Atlantic Association of Community Health Centers was received. The comment requested MHCC keep the benchmark waiver period at two years due to concerns about the potential impact on consumers. Staff supports maintaining the current two-year benchmark waiver. Next slide, please. Staff requests the commission adopt changes to COMAR 1025-17 as final proposed permanent amendments with the modification of eliminating language extending the waiver from two to five years. This concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Hi, I'm just, uh, just a comment. Um, I would have voted against it if you hadn't amended the waiver. Kept it at two years rather than five. So I think that's a good thing. I have a question, I guess, about the other changes because when I first read these, I thought, okay, we're extending the waiver to five years. So then we'll, okay, there's a change now. You have to notify us because it's such a long waiver, or you can withdraw the waiver for cause because it's such a long waiver. Aren't these other changes kind of predicated? It seemed to me like we were extending. These other changes are actually predicated on the idea that now we had a five-year waiter waiver, so we needed to put some guardrails on it. It seems like we've taken the five-year waiver off the table. But so it's just guardrails for a road that we no longer have. Like, it's still a two-year waiver period, so they are still required if within that two years to come back. So it's it's not like they're coming back to us every year anyway. So we would want to know if some circumstances drastically change within the two years that would necessitate a potential review of their waiver. Are, are these remaining changes driven by a particular problem or incident? Or it, 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 it sort of seems like that if we don't extend the waiver, the whole purpose of the revisions kind of falls apart and we just leave things the way they were. Like, uh, um, There's no incident that it's driving this. I think it, it ends up the regulations a little bit more makes it more clear, particularly for the withdrawal of the waiver. It, it kind of outlines the process. While that was something that we could have done, I think this made it a little bit more clear and structured on the process for that. And then also gives the payer the um, ability to ask for a review of that if we say, you know, we're going to withdraw the waiver. So it just makes it a little more streamlined and in line with other provisions as and well. I think under the answer, but just make sure, is there any? From these changes, is there an additional administrative burden that's being imposed? I didn't see one. So, okay. Any other questions? With that, uh, can I have a motion to, motion to adopt COMAR 10 2517 benchmarks for pre authorization okay. of healthcare services as final regulations of the commission? Now, I'd love uh, to go on record making a motion for this one. <laughs> Mr. Bozinski has made the motion. Mr. Boyles, do you want to be the second? Okay, great. All if, all if, all right, is there any discussion? I'll call the question then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Chairman, it's a self-selecting group. The kind of people that show up in person driving three hours are the people who are going to be very interested. I appreciate your engagement. Moving the ball. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you. Agenda item number four is a certificate of need for DWI services for Avenues Recovery, DBA Avenues Recovery Center of Maryland. Avenues Recovery Center is an existing substance abuse disorder provider that seeks to establish a new 20 bed track one intermediate care facility for adults providing a program of withdrawal management and treatment services consistent with ASAM level 3.7 for patients needing medically monitored intensive inpatient services in Prince Frederick, Calvert County. Program manager and CEO and analyst Bill Chan will present the staff recommendation. Bill, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Sergeant, and good afternoon, Commissioners. DWI Services, Inc., doing business as Avenues Recovery Center of Maryland, proposes to establish a 20-bed track one intermediate care facility for adults in an existing alcohol and drug abuse treatment center in Prince Frederick, Calvert County. This 93-bed center offers a continuum of substance use disorder services from outpatient to residential treatment. The project would allow the center to provide a higher level of care comparable to the American Society of Addiction Medicines, level 3.7, providing medically monitored intensive inpatient care for withdrawal management and subsequent inpatient treatment. A track one ICF, as defined in the state health plan, is a facility in which the majority of the patients serve to rely on private insurance or their own resources to pay for services. The total estimated project cost is $55,000, which the applicant will fund with cash. Both program will operate on the second floor of the existing facility. Avenues is owned by Yehuda Alter and Yosef Cohen. These two also own and operate nine other ICFs across five states, including the Avenues Recovery Center for Chesapeake Bay in Cambridge, which obtained a CON approval in October 2021. The current state health plan standards include a methodology projecting the need for track one ICF beds. However, staff recommends that the commission find this need standard to be inapplicable due to a statutory change in 2019 to, to, to CON, which now makes this standard obsolete. With this change, existing programs can add any number of beds without the need for commission approval. Staff notes that while Avenue seeks to establish a track one ICF, the proposed program will serve a large proportion of low-income patients enrolled in Medicaid, in addition to individuals using third-party, uh, private third-party payers. This type of payer mix would characterize this program as a track two facility. Presently, there's only one track one ICF serving Southern Maryland, which is the 64-bed program operated by Recovery Centers of America, Capital Region, and Waldorf, Charles County which do not accept and treat Medicaid enrolled patients. There are also three track two ICFs, the 59 beds at Hope House and Laurel, and the 50 beds at Pyramid Walden and Bowie, both in Prince George's County, and the 27 beds at Pyramid Walden, Charlotte Hall, St. Mary's County. Based on the facility's historical utilization in Maryland, Avenues indicates that a proposed program will serve patients who reside both in and outside the state project is not expected to have an appreciable impact on either the existing substance use disorder providers in Southern Maryland on the cost of charge or charges for these services. Finally, the applicant demonstrates that it has sufficient equity to fund the project and that the proposed project is a viable operation. For these reasons, staff recommends approval of the Avenues project. Staff recommends that if the commission approves the CON for this project, it includes the following three conditions, which are standard conditions that staff recommends the commission should issue to applicants which address, one, service to low-income persons, two, meaning accreditation for local 3.7 services, and three, timely notification to the commission and the Behavioral Health Administration should its accreditation license be revoked or suspended. Before moving further, I would like to introduce several individuals representing avenues who are present at this meeting uh, these include Mr. Hudi Alter, the founder and CEO, Mimi Schleicher, Director of Regulatory Compliance, Nikki Berger, Executive Assistant, and Carolyn Jacobs, Counsel. Uh, with that, I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'll start with the motion. Thank you, Bill. I have a motion to approve the certificate of need for DWI Services, Inc., DBA Avenues Recovery Center of Maryland, Calvert County. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
to establish an alcoholism and drug abuse and immediate care facility. Commissioner Dorden. Yeah, Commissioner Dorden made the motion. Commissioner Wang, the second. Excellent. Is there any discussion or questions? That yeah, I will call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Hearing none, the motion has passed. Thank you, Bella. Thanks to all the folks from. Thank you very much. Thank you to all, and thank you to uh, Bill Chan for this staff report of the patients with the applicant. Thank you. That would we'll turn to agenda item five, certificate of ongoing performance for cardiac surgery services at UPMC Western Maryland. The next agenda item, the consideration of UPMC Western Maryland's application for a certificate of ongoing performance for cardiac surgery services, Uki Alange, Program manager will explain the purposes of the certificate of, ongoing, of ongoing review process and then an overview of the staff report. And I hope I didn't mangle your name. Did I say it correctly? That's good. Thank you. And um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, Commissioner's Executive Director, um, MHCC staff, and all members of the public. As previously stated, um, today I will be presenting on the application for a certificate of ongoing performance by the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Western Maryland henceforth referred to as the UPMC Western Maryland. The cardiac surgery chapter, Puma 10.24.17, it contains several standards for evaluating the performance of established cardiac surgery programs to determine if a certificate of ongoing performance should be issued. An approved certificate of ongoing performance must not exceed five years. Um, UPMC Western Maryland is a 200 bed general hospital is located in Cumberland, Allegheny County, and is part of the Western Maryland Health Planning Region, and the only hospital in the region that provides cardiac surgery services. Next slide, please. Now I'll be sharing a couple of findings from the review of the hospital's application and its alignment with the coma standards previously mentioned. I may be interchangeably calling the hospital, either hospital or the program. The first standard is that all programs are required to participate in uniform data collection and reporting through the Society of Thoracic Surgeons um, Adult Cardiac Surgery Database. And um, the hospital has been participating in this by sub submitting all required data between January 2018 through the end of December 2021. And for this reason, the hospital is in compliance with this standard. The next standard requires the chief executive officer of the hospital to certify that the hospital fully complies with each requirement for conducting and completing specified quality assurance activities. We did receive a signed certification for full compliance and with this requirement from the, chief, the president of the hospital. And for this reason, this program is in compliance with this standard. The next one on the current slide shows that the hospital shall demonstrate that it has taken appropriate action in response to concerns that are identified through its quality assurance processes. Um, as pertaining to this standard, um, this hospital continues to conduct various quality assurance um, processes and identify several standards um, that they have really taken care of. However, Per the coma standards, um, quality assurance activities are also required to include a peer review of cases, both internal and external. UPMC Western Maryland did not conduct any um, internal peer reviews because they had just one cardiac surgeon on board. And um, they also did not elevate any of their um, cases to an external review. However, um, we're not concerned about this because this hospital um, the risk adjusted mortality rate for cardiac surgery in this hospital was low, and um, the quality assurance measures put in place continue to show that this hospital continues to operate in a safe manner. Um, there are no concerns whatsoever, like I stated, and the risk adjusted mortality rate is actually similar to the national benchmark. And um, effective in January of last year, the hospital decided to start to participate in the internal peer review process with the larger hospital system and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, so they will start to do that henceforth. However, they've not been required to do that because they've had 
barely any mortalities or any significant mortality, morbidities. Next slide, please. On this slide, um, we find a table that shows um, the star ratings for UPMC Western Maryland between January 2018 and December of 2020, as well as some three year data that they also received from the SDS. This standard in coma states that the hospital shall maintain an STF ACSD score for isolated cabbages of two stars or, or higher. There are four components that are considered when given hospitals the rating or a composite star rating. Um, the first one is the absence of mortality, which is actually any mortalities that take place while the individual is on admission in the hospital for cardiac surgery or any mortalities that take place within 30 days of discharge, no matter the cause of the death. And um, this measure, this first measure actually weighs 80% of all the four measures. The second measure that accumulates in this rating um, is the absence of, operative, of major operative morbidity. Um, the morbidities that are considered are um, the prolonged ventilation, um, deep uh, mediastinitis, and three others actually um, that are considered in that measure. The third measure that goes into the composite rating is the use of the internal mammary artery for the graft because this particular artery has been shown to be associated with better outcomes um, on the long term. And the fourth one is the receipt of all four specific perioperative medications, including the pre and the post op beta blockers, antiplatelets, as well as antilipids. Um, the hospital, as we can see on this particular slide, had a two-star rating for all the 12 months. A two-star rating shows that the hospital is not doing better or worse than any other hospitals. So the hospital continues to do well. And um, throughout 2021, there was no data submit received from SDS because they had changed their data warehouse during that period. And also on this slide, you would see that they also had some ratings for three-year time period from July 2018 through June 2021 and June 2019 through December 2021. And um, this was also done because the, um, the, the way that they have collected data had changed during that period. And the confidence interval was changed to a 95% confidence interval during that period. And SDS also did a three year because typically we would do the star rating for isolated cabbages, but they noticed that there was a decline in the number of cabbages being performed because the case mix of surgeries being done was changing because of advanced technology or whatever we might have. Um, so this hospital complies with this standard based on the star rating. Next slide, please. On this slide, um, it shows, this figure shows the 30-day risk adjusted mortality for the hospital as compared to the national average. And this measure, this standard in Kuma is that the hospital shall maintain an all cost study day risk adjusted mortality rate for cabbages that exceeds the national average at a 95% confidence interval. Based on this slide and the uh, reports that were received from this, from this hospital, this hospital um, is doing, is performing similar to other hospitals based on the SDS national average, and is not statistically different from other hospitals, but continues um, to do well. And based on this standard, um, we think the hospital is also in compliance with this measure as well. And on this slide, what we would see is that the yellow dot, which represents um, the STS national average, falls within the confidence interval of the hospital and not outside the confidence interval. And that's what shows that it's in compliance with the standard. Next slide, please. I'm sorry. Did I ask a question before yes, we sir. move on from the, so the I, I picked up from this in the star ratings and from this chart that they're performing about the national average for those types of programs. And I was just wondering how I, how I should feel about that because it could be average is fantastic. These are great programs, or it could be like, oh no, we need to pull them up. They're just average out. In this, in this case, the fact that they're performing at the national average would that be read as an extremely good thing or a bad thing or somewhere in the middle? So we consider it a good thing because that means they are not an outlier on the negative side of the bar because um, they are similar to what operates in other hospitals nationally. So that's really what we want. Thank you. So, next, okay, on this slide. The first two standards on this slide have already been previously discussed from, discussed from the figures. And then the final standard on this slide um, states that the hospital, this last standard says that the program shall maintain an annual volume of 200 or more cases 
And in the coma, any program that does not maintain, maintain an average of 100 cases for two consecutive years will be subject to a focused review. Um, and this is based on prior research that has shown that hospitals that perform at least 200 cases of cardiac surgery every year tend to do better, um, is the basis for having the 200 as the threshold. Um, this standard for this hospital, we say they are not in compliance with this standard because on all the different years that um, they were checked, um, that they provided data, none of the years reached the 200 mark threshold. However, they do not meet the 100, um, 100 volume threshold. Um, in 2018, they had a volume of 94 cases. Um, in the year after, they had a volume of about 101 cases. So they do not qualify for having a focus review anyway. In addition, because of the COVID pandemic and the impact on hospitals, this standard, the volume standard will wait for all programs in 2020 and 2021. So our consideration about this is that though the hospital is not in compliance with this standard, available data shows that UPMC, Western Maryland continues to provide safe and high quality care. For this reason, we're not concerned. Um, and the final slide has the recommendation of the executive director um, to be that the commission should issue a certificate of ongoing performance that permits UPMC Western Maryland to continue. I'm sorry, next slide, please. Um, that permits the, um, the hospital to continue providing cardiac surgery services for the next four years. With us today is um, Savannah Kenny, who is the director of the Heart and, Heart and Vascular Institute at the UPMC Western Maryland. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, and I'll take any questions now. Okay. So uh, I'll put a motion on the table. I have to read it though. Do I have a motion to approve the certificates of ongoing performance for cardiac surgery services a UPMC Western Maryland. Commissioner yeah. Boyle has made a motion. Do I have a second? Commissioner Buzinski? Excellent. Is it, are there any questions? It's a quick question. It's a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Yeah, but the third requirements, they have to have an annual volume of 200, but it's been, uh, which triggers a focus review, but it's been waived because of the pandemic. And you said something about if they dip under 100, what, what, what happens? If if for two consecutive years, if they have a volume that is 100 or less, they'll be subject to a focus review, meaning that we're going to work with the hospital and have an external reviewer of all their cases, of their cases to find out why they have that low volume. Um, and this is a rural hospital, so that might explain the volume. Um, but they continue based on their risk adjusted mortality, they do well. But that's the more um, the reason behind that. But they have to have it consistently for two years. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. Just uh, <clears throat> follow up on that. We as a commission don't have the authority to take away a, a certificate of need um, if they got down to five, right? I'm sorry, sir. If they got down to 10 a, a year, um, given that this goes back almost 20, uh, well, 30 years now, all kind. We wouldn't have the authority as a as a commission to take away their CON anyway. We? we actually do because the coma states that the executive yep. director can take it away. Um, so when that happens, we do the focus review. We proffer some solutions. They develop a plan. Um, they work towards the plan. They'll be given another year. If in the third year they have another less than 100, the executive director has the discretion um, to take away their capability to perform cardiac surgery services. Really? It's a, it's a certificate of ongoing performance. So, yeah, um, that's okay. Law changed in 20, 2012, and we, have, we apply these conditions, same provisions. Um, Definitely. Is that for any service? Cardiac services only. Oh, just cardiac. PCI and cardiac surgery. So, number of beds at that hospital? 200. What's your average daily census? You know, I know that. I could check. <laughs> Does any of the commissioners on the line have any questions or, or discussion? <laughs> This is Commissioner Bindari. Ben, some of the hospitals have much lower volume, right? Am I right? On consecutive years. Less so than they, So they do. Um, if it's less than 200, they will 
just note it, but if it gets less than 100 for at least two consecutive years, then that would trigger the focus review. For so when the, any if the focus review, say, if, let's say it remains 50, 60, and the focus review says it's okay, then they continue to have their uh, uh, services approved as it is. Although, you know, in these cases, the higher the volume, the better the quality is. Right. That's a great question, actually. Um, that So typically what we expect is that the focus review might have some recommendations that they would develop a plan for. But what I hear you say is that per adventure, there are no recommendations because they're doing well anyway. Um, I'm not sure. It'd be a, best, a bridge best crossed if we get to it. So we have not, um, we have not encountered that situation. The uh, cardiac surgery program at Capital Region operates under some special uh, provisions uh, that allow Capital Region to basically reestablish its program, um, and, and it will be quickly coming with the same sort of, of regulatory oversight. But um, at this point, it doesn't yet. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we call the question? Hearing none, I will. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Do I hear any anyone opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes. Thank you. Uh, I do want to note, uh, Commissioner Wood recused herself from agenda item four and indeed did not speak and had her camera off. So I just want to make sure we put that in the record. And if anyone else wants to recuse, please just speak up so that we will make sure that it shows up in the minutes. Um, so that there won't be any later allegations of impropriety that are unwarranted. That we could turn to agenda item number six, which I believe uh, Commissioner O'Grady may be recusing himself for. So agenda item number six is the final report on telehealth, telehealth preserve telehealth access act of 2021. The preserve telehealth access act of 2021 requires MHCC to study the impact of telehealth, develop recommendations on telehealth coverage and payment levels relative to in-person care. The MHCC is required to submit a report to the Senate's finance committee and the house health and government operations committee by December 1, 2022. Presenting the study findings is David Sharp, Director of the Center for Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery, Nikki Majewski, Chief, Health Information Technology, Alana Knudsen, Director, Norb Walsh, Center for Rural Health Analysis, and David Cooney, Associate Commissioner, Life and Health at the Maryland Insurance Administration. Welcome, everyone. And I will give the floor to David Sharp. Start off. Right. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, it's with great excitement that we are here today to present a work of, of our labor of love, if you will, for the last 18 months or so. Um, and there are many stakeholders who you can't see that are behind us in this um, presentation today. Um, too many to call out actually. So um, let me just sort of frame up a little bit um, about uh, telehealth and where it's been and where it's come from. Um, telehealth has come a long way since 1964 when providers at the University of Nebraska established a two-way television setup linked with a state hospital to perform video consultations. Fast forward to 2020, where executive orders issued in response to the COVID-19 pandemic pushed telehealth to the forefront in care delivery. Payers rapidly expanded telehealth coverage, diffusion among providers occurred quickly, and consumer adoption skyrocketed. Post COVID-19 public health emergency, stakeholders recognized that telehealth should remain a feature in care delivery. Next slide, please. Chapter 70 and 71 of the 2021 laws of Maryland, Preserve Telehealth Access Act of 2021, maintains that existing coverage and reimbursement established during the COVID-19 public health emergency and requires MHCC to study the impact of telehealth as it relates to its use of audio only and audiovisual technologies, somatic and behavioral health care interventions. 
The act follows on an MHCC convened telehealth policy work group in the fall of 2020. The work group consisted of about 70 diverse stakeholders that discussed changes to telehealth policies implemented in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. The work group suggested that MHCC study telehealth's impact on coverage, cost, consumers, and providers. This afternoon, you will hear from a panel of participants, my colleagues from left and right, present on the study activities and the 15 draft recommendations. The recommendations provide a framework for potential future legislation. Let's go on to the next slide, please. The MHCC timeline of events leading up to the work are shown on this slide. Staff regularly updated stakeholders on the status of the work through a dedicated web page and push email notifications. It is worth noting stakeholder engagement that stakeholder engagement was a key component of this study. Uh, let's proceed. Next slide. NORC or NORC that we often call them, was tasked with completing quantitative and qualitative research on telehealth and to develop a technical report that would serve as the underpinnings for the MHCC's recommendation report. Next slide, please. The work targeted six categories shown on this slide. And the uh, within each slide, within each block rather, it is sort of an overview of the breadth of each of these categories. Dr. Knudsen to my right will present momentarily on the study activities. Before I turn the presentation over, next slide please, to Dr. Knudsen, I would like to highlight some of her achievements and activities. Hold on, we can proceed one slide. Dr. Knudsen serves as a program area director the Public Health Department at NORC and is the director of NORC's Walsh Center for Rural Health Analysis. Dr. Knudsen has over 25 years experience implementing and directing public health programs, leading health services and research policy projects, and evaluating program effectiveness. Dr. Knudsen currently leads three projects that include a telehealth focus. She serves on the Maryland Rural Policy Research Institute Health Panel, Board of Directors for the Maryland Rural Health Association, the National Rural Health Resource Center, and the Rural Health Foundation. Dr. Knudsen received the 2021 National Rural Health Association Researcher of the Year Award. Dr. Knudsen, it's a pleasure to introduce you to the commission, and I ask that you proceed with the presentation. Great. Thank you so very much for having me back, and thank you for being such wonderful partners in this study. I would like to first begin by wishing you a national happy Rural Health Day. Today is the day that we recognize the contributions of rural health, and so I will begin with a happy National Rural Health Day to one and all. Thank you. Uh, That's why we are having this meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for arranging this for us. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to share with you the findings from our study, and I also want to acknowledge that all of this work was done with a large team, and the person who led the claims analysis is Dr. Jennifer Smith, and she has a long history of conducting analysis using Maryland's claims data, and she is on the Zoom call today, so if we have any specific questions, we will call upon her expertise. Next slide, please. As uh, David mentioned, we reached out to Maryland consumers. We talked to 78 consumers that represented the various uh, geographic and demographic makeup of the state of Maryland. And we also had over 1,083 providers respond to an online survey. And we asked questions to better understand their perspectives of telehealth. And when we looked at the issue of telehealth permanence, there was an interest in maintaining audio only and audio visual technology options. The preference was for audio visual, but there was a recognition that we needed to have audio only as an option because in some instances there are challenges with technology in terms of broadband connectivity. 
There's also issues of technology literacy, if you will. And some consumers in our state may have difficulties using smartphones, tablets, and the like. And lastly, there was also a recognition that there are some very sensitive topics that sometimes lend themselves better to an audio only conversation. Consumers specifically identified advantages to using telehealth, including convenience, agency in selecting a provider, protecting their privacy, and also feeling more heard by providers. And let me expand on that a little bit. That was in reference to having the attention of their provider on their screen. And the comment was made in, in the reference that oftentimes when you go to a provider, they are sitting at a distance and are looking at their own computer screen. Whereas when you have an audiovisual telehealth consult, you have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, inner exchange that uh, supports uh, that better connection with people. Uh, next slide, please. We also asked provider perceptions about how audio-only telehealth affected um, care for different types of groups. And what we saw was that our behavioral health providers were somewhat more um, supportive of using audio-only technologies than somatic care providers. However, if you look at the third line there that asked a question about patients with disabilities, there was some concern uh, whether or not the audio only and uh, that type of telehealth technology would support care provided to people with disabilities. Next slide, please. We also then asked the same question specific to audiovisual technologies. And again, we saw very similar patterns where our behavioral health providers were more perceptive in terms of having telehealth support different types of providers. But again, there was concern identified by the respondents in both behavioral health and somatic health about how effective audio visual telehealth was in supporting uh, the care provided to people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna switch gears, but before I do for utilization, I also wanted to just pop back and just mention the consumers also identified some positive supports in reducing costs for them to access telehealth services, including uh, the transportation costs, the time costs in traveling to a provider that they were saving using telehealth. And also there was some discussion about telehealth supporting people that have mobility challenges. And especially in areas where you sometimes have weather issues, uh, being able to utilize telehealth was a way to be able to ensure they could access their providers even when they had snow or ice to address. So with utilization, let's take a look at what we learned about who is using telehealth in Maryland. Next slide, please. In Maryland, as in other parts of the country, we found that urban individuals were more likely to use telehealth than rural individuals. We also found that younger individuals in Maryland were more likely to use telehealth than older individuals. That was not a surprise, especially given the uptake in using different types of telehealth services and using that technology. It was interesting to note that providers mentioned that patients with limited English language proficiency were less likely to engage in telehealth services. And that we gleaned from our provider survey. Next slide, please. We also looked at the claims data. And this slide looks at the number of evaluation and management telehealth services per month in Maryland from 2020 to 21 across the commercial and Medicaid claims and solely for 2020 for the Medicare claims. And why we are only looking at one year of data for Medicare was that with the short turnaround for this study, 
we did not have ample time to be able to secure a Medicare data use agreement. So we then relied on other vendors for being able to run the Medicare data. And what we saw, the difference between the vendor that ran the data for 2020 versus the vendor that ran the data for 2021 was a difference in suppression. And it was too complicated with the limited time that we had to be able to unpack what that data suppression did with regard to utilization. So to keep the data clear, we are just using the 2020 data for these slides. I also want to show that on the right side of the scale, those are COVID-19 cases. And as you can see on the left side, those are telehealth services. And you can see that over time, at the very beginning of the pandemic, when we had in-person services shuttered, you saw we had a large spike in the use of telehealth services. And then over time, we saw people returning to inpatient care and the proportion and number of telehealth services declined. However, one area I would like to point out is that top color, that top bar, that represents behavioral health. And as you can see, when COVID cases increased, when the Omicron variant increased in December, we also saw the use of telehealth for behavioral health services in particular increase. Next slide, please. This slide provide. oh, certainly. I may could ask a question about the January 20 numbers. Like it's really flat. Are those actual numbers that were really flat or is it more like you just had the chart had to start somewhere? Like you see what I mean? Like at January to February, it's like, Essentially at zero. And this so it should zero. Yeah, it, 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 we had low COVID numbers at that point. Oh, I'm sorry, I was asking sorry. about the telehealth line. <laughs> oh, oh, it, absolutely. And, and this is exactly what um, David was talking about at the beginning. Remember, before COVID, telehealth, especially on the Medicare side, was reimbursed for rural residents receiving telehealth services from a distant provider in a rural designated, for example, rural health clinic uh, or a federally qualified health center. And that was called an origination site. I can't even, I'm supposed to be listening to it and it's so boring. I can't. When you call us boring. Oh, that hurt. We're very excited about these findings, I can tell you. But, but what, what this illustrates here, you're exactly right. It illustrates, and this is what we found. If you look at one of the new ASPE reports, they saw a 3,000-fold increase in the use of telehealth across in Medicare. But it's because the telehealth service was primarily used for distant providers who were specialty providers, and the person that received those services as a Medicare beneficiary had to be located in a rural community in a rural provider's office. So it, it was very, very limited. And, and to put context to this, I went to my first telehealth meeting in 1995, and the issues that we were discussing then were limited on technology. Now we're not limited on technology. And you can see, as David said, the explosion in the use of telehealth. But as we are going to go through and as we continue to look, the next slide provides um, the same information as a proportion. And did that answer your question? Yes, I sort of have a follow-up because in, within the NORC report, which I feel like I've memorized all 255 pages, but now it notes that prior to, so where you see it at almost zero, it's not far off because Studies have shown that it's been around 1% prior to the pandemic. And Jeez. I, I would also add, we just completed a study in the past. And what was interesting was for when you look at Medicare telehealth use, the states that had the highest use of telehealth or Medicare pre-COVID had the lowest use post-COVID. So what we're seeing is a total shift in the utilization of care. Yes. That's great. The great presentations are fine. I don't mean to derail your momentum. I just had a question about your previous slide about who used uh, telehealth services. Yes. Now, one of the primary advantages of telehealth is, of course, promoting access to care, removing barriers that prevent underserved populations from accessing care. But it says here that for folks whose uh, you know primary language is in English, they're less likely to use the telehealth. So, kind of, uh, 
provide any, any insight from your findings as to why that is, and then perhaps your thoughts on how telehealth delivery could be optimized in order to better serve these populations? That's a great question. And, and that also feeds into the recommendations because one of the things when you conduct claims analysis, there is no variable about language preference. So we are not able to look at the claims and be able to identify whether or not that patient has, uh, can speak if their first language is English or if they speak English at all. So that is a limitation in claims. Likewise, when we ask these questions, we ask them of the providers, what was their perspective? Why, what, what did they say? And that's the response that we received. The providers were concerned that the telehealth might limit the ability to communicate effectively with people who have English as a second language. And yesterday, I just had a discussion with the National Health Service Board um, advisory board member, and he works in Texas. And one of the comments that he mentioned was that telehealth is limiting from the standpoint of interpreters being part of that experience. It's much more cumbersome than when you have the person in the clinic and you can also have more body language and more in a better exchange. So he confirmed that with his client or his clients on the behavioral health side and patients on somatic side, it was more challenging to deliver care if the clinician and the patient did not speak the same language. If they speak the same language, what, regardless of the length, language that they are common to speak, it is effective. Is that helpful? Absolutely. That's some good color to it. This is Commissioner Mandari. I have a question. Uh, ahead, uh, thank you so much. My question is, you know, mentioned there is an audio and audio and uh, visual. So what percent is audio only and what percent is audio visual? And um, I'm sure other practicing physician who practice, sometimes I really get uh, really um, baffled how much visual really add to the audio. Because, you know, many patients, uh, we start with the audio visual and the, the technology is not good, their internet is not working well, then we end up with the audio at the end of the visit. So how much visual really add and what percentage was audio only and what percentage was audio visual? Thank you. That, that is a great question and one that we all struggled with in part, again, because when we looked at the claims, I'm going to show you a couple of slides um, in the later part of this presentation, which separates audio only from audio visual on the Medicaid side. But what was challenging when we stood up telehealth as quickly as needed to accommodate the public health emergency, we did not have codes that were being uniformly used to identify for the payers what was audio only and what was audio visual. We also learned that when people started in an audio visual encounter, that it might shift to audio only for those very reasons that you identified. Uh, broadband may not have been robust enough to be able to handle the video component, or there might be just challenges connecting to the different applications that people needed to make that connection work. So to your point, that is also playing into the recommendation to continue studying this, because what we're finding going forward is that people, um, payers in particular, are requiring more specificity in making sure that those billing codes are appropriate for audio only and audio visual. So we can get a better sense of the use and the experience of the two different modes of technology. Hmm? So is there, is there going to be a difference in the payment for audio only and audio visual only in the future? I know right now payments are probably seen. Probably, can, can we put a, a pin in this one? As, I'm sure we will talk about it, but maybe we go through the rest of the presentation and come back to oh, it. Oh, hang on, on this pin, okay, we're okay. good. Okay. Excellent, well, we'll go on then to the next slide. Uh, the next slide provides the same information. However, it provides the proportion of evaluation and management telehealth. So you can see how proportionally telehealth is delivered over time. Previous slide was the number, this one provides that proportion. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, this is a comparison between somatic care and behavioral health care. And again, it compares the proportions of care that was delivered. And I just want to highlight that bottom bar, that darkest bar is for health care, and that only goes through 2020. But as you can see, uh, we saw a, a crescendo, if you will, for somatic care, obviously, when the public health emergencies uh, first began, and then we saw a leveling out. Likewise, in behavioral health, we saw a large increase in the use of uh, telehealth services. And you can see over time, it has leveled out, but it hasn't fallen at the same level that somatic care has fallen for the delivery of telehealth services. And again, you can see that blip and on the behavioral health care uh, utilization for the telehealth services when the Omicron variant was prevalent in Maryland. Next slide. Uh, this slide provides the differences between somatic care uh, for Medicaid claims in Maryland, and it provides specific information about audiovisual and audio only. To speak to that difference between the audiovisual and audio only, it was my, I'm a rural family medicine doctor, so you know, I've struggled with trying to do telehealth in a rural community. It was my understanding that as a somatic care provider, coverage was available for audiovisual um, telehealth. And to do audio only, it was a documented exception to you know, failure or patient preference. Patient says, I don't want to do it. So, so it was not, there was not equal access from a billing regulatory E&M status um, or perspective on audio versus audiovisual. So um, to me, when I look at this, this is understandable because it was audio only by exception and it wasn't uh, audio, it wasn't enough equal opportunity to do either the combined or the audio only services. And you highlight a finding that we jump ahead with consumers who were confused as well as providers about what the actual coverage was and how it was reimbursed. So that was definitely an issue that we heard on both the provider side and the consumer side. Absolutely. Any other questions on the slide? Okay, next slide, please. This one uh, is the same data for Medicaid, but it's looking at behavioral health services. And again, you can see that the use of behavioral health services for telehealth was higher than somatic care. And uh, likewise, the audiovisual um, consistent with somatic care was also more greatly utilized than audio only. Excellent. All right, so we shift gears to cost. Next, next slide, please. When we asked Maryland consumers, they believed that telehealth reduces costs, but they were unsure of the coverage that they had for that telehealth. And they attributed the cost savings to convenience. And consumers especially told us that not having transportation costs was advantageous. The ability to participate in uh, clinical visits from home was helpful, particularly when they had kids in school and they were going to school through uh, uh, web uh, connections at their homes. And also providers waived co-pays during the COVID pandemic. That also was a positive for them to be able to use telehealth. They also thought it was helpful because they could continue participating in their preventive care and they thought that this then reduced their need for urgent care visits and emergency department visits okay. so, and the associated co-pays or costs that were associated with accessing that type of care. But to the earlier discussion, they also shared they were unclear about coverage and reimbursement. And some of the telehealth services required a follow-up visit. And they felt that that sometimes ended up in additional co-pays. And so consumers were not always clear about what 
kind of copay they would have had had they not had that initial telehealth uh, connection with their provider. They also thought that there could be some potential negative consequences if they delayed care. And so uh, they, they wanted to make sure that that was a consideration as we talk about what telehealth policies go forward. Next slide, please. As noted, we had uh, a couple of different behavioral health group participant uh, focus groups. One included providers and one included uh, advocates for patients. And they believed that the telehealth was very cost effective. And they thought it also extended the reach of behavioral health services here in Maryland. And it also provided immediate access to address mental health issues. And as you know, in some of our rural areas in particular, we have limited access to uh, behavioral health services, and they felt that this was an opportunity for them to be able to get uh, coverage immediately, and some even referenced that it may have provided life-saving care, especially during that time of high anxiety. It also was an opportunity to reduce no-show weights, and they thought it also potentially reduced hospitalization because that intervention was able to be uh, occur immediately. They also recommended that payment and coverage parity be provided for public health or for telehealth rather, and to ensure that audio only and audio visual telehealth were going to require the same provider efforts. So then they thought it also should require the same reimbursement because of those fixed costs and resources that were needed to provide that care. Next slide, please. Uh, when we asked providers about access and barriers to telehealth, one of the things that we found was that the, uh, that the behaviors, a third to two thirds of them, uh, believed that reimbursement was a barrier. It was a greater barrier for somatic care providers um, in their eyes than for behavioral health. They also were concerned about some of the rules and regulations and being uncertain about how to navigate those with regard to telehealth and that that continued to be a barrier to telehealth access. Any questions on this slide? Next slide, please. So overall for our conclusions, Consumers and providers value the option of including audio only and audio visual technologies as a complement to in-person care. Behavioral health focus groups participants really recommended the importance of payment parity for audio visual and audio only visits. And lastly, additional claims data analyses are needed to be able to determine if telehealth services are cost effective, what level of quality they provide, and what is their role in advancing health equity. I may add that one limitation we had in conducting our claims analysis was that the vast majority of claims did not include race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity is populated in the Medicare claims data, about 70%, but we do not have that same level of population for that variable in our commercial and our Medicaid claims. Next slide. This is the fun part. This is where our study findings influence the recommendations. And this first section of recommendations relate to the permanence of telehealth coverage and technology. And this really provided a basis looking at our different findings from access where they want the option to be able to have audio visual and audio only technologies. Uh, providers and consumers appreciated having the option to use these and to look at whether or not these claims were being utilized, we need to get a little bit clearer on audio only versus audio visual. And we also looked at the cost. And as you can see, the recommendations that rolled out were continuing to use telehealth by healthcare providers. 
by allowing audiovisual technology and audio only technology under certain circumstances and utilizing communication technologies that comply with national privacy and security standards. Next slide, please. These recommendations fall under the rubric of meeting consumers and patients where they are. And again, they're based on what we learned in the three categories of access, utilization, and cost. The first recommendation is allowing healthcare providers to use remote patient monitoring to obtain consent at the time services are furnished and collect a minimum of two days of data over a 30-day period. The fourth one, um, and these align and map to the recommendations that MHCC presented in the report, allow hospice services to use telehealth um, prior to COVID that was not allowable. Likewise, allowing telehealth in hospital, uh, hospital inpatient and nursing homes. Again, we saw a great utilization of Medicare uh, residents using telehealth um, from their nursing home, so they did not need to be transported during COVID. Next slide, please. The last bucket is adequate reimbursement and insurance coverage. And this particular recommendation, again, recognizes the need to continue payment levels for telehealth services relative to in-person for at least 24 months so that MHCC can conduct a study to examine patient payment for audio only and audiovisual technologies and better understand the quality, cost effectiveness, and how it advances health equity. And that concludes our findings. Any questions? Well. Oh, thank you, wonderful presentation. Um, I was uh, reading um, some of the information then that you sent uh, uh, yesterday, I guess the full technical report yes. in ORC. Um, I didn't have time to go through in as much depth as I'd like to, but a couple of things have jumped out to me um, that, you know, again, I, I think telehealth is a very positive view of it, I've used. Um, but, a down, potential downside, if we don't look at it, um, uh, what one patient uh, brought up in that report, a concern that they could get telehealth appointments, but they had to wait weeks for an in-person appointment. And I, I know there was also a concern about uh, uh, providers being paid for shorter follow-up interactions and encouraging low value and expensive care. Um, what are, with the study we're talking about, look at ways to make sure that patients aren't forced into something that perhaps they do want in person. I mean, I think telehealth's great, as I said, don't get me wrong, but um, are, are there any concerns out there that you know patients could be um, shortchanged with some providers? I guess that's the question. From a research standpoint, that really requires a lot of qualitative data collection. Again, talking to consumers, that type of data is not going to be easily identified in a claims analysis. It is really going to require talking to providers and talking to patients, as well as payers, because finance drives function. And so understanding too how that finance piece or that reimbursement piece might be driving utilization is an important consideration. And uh, that's a good segue because when uh, Mr. Clooney starts talking, he's going to touch a little bit upon uh, this particular question that you've raised. Another pin. <laughs> we'll come back to it. All right. All right. Have you have more segments? Yeah, we have. Uh, we're going to. Discuss with Nikki Majewski, my colleague to my left, is going to talk a little bit more about the recommendations and some of the rationales. Well, thank you, Dr. Knetzkin. That MHCC wants to commend the NORC team for all their hard work over the last year, which resulted in the technical report on the study findings, which informed the development of the draft recommendations that we are about to present. And I want to give you a bit of a sneak peek. Um, I will step through each of them now um, in the next several slides. No, we included a couple of bullet points with supporting rationale from the report to provide some perspective during the presentation. And as previously um, noted, the draft recommendations are intended to um, provide a framework for future legislation. Next slide, please. The um, 
Five permanency of telehealth coverage recommendations are intended to ensure equitable access to care. It's worth noting that before the public emergency, um, and much what Alana had talked about as well, uh, payers provided some reimbursement for telehealth. However, coverage was uneven across payers. Um, as listed on this slide, I'm not going to go through the recommendation verbatim. I'm going to just hit on the gist of it. Uh, but this first recommendation is to uh, continue to allow any healthcare provider to use telehealth. And this recommendation addresses variation in telehealth coverage by payers. And uh, this was that concern expressed by consumers um, regarding the potential unevenness of coverage. Next. I have a question about this one. This recommendation that focuses on the provider, not the service, right? So service is available to telehealth. This recommendation is just the type of the provider on the other end of the line should it matter. But we are we're not talking about like mandating any service is appropriate for telehealth. That's correct. Next slide. Permanency of telehealth coverage too is to allow use of audio visual and audio only telehealth under certain circumstances. This recommendation ensures that telehealth remains a convenient option that provides access to resources and care for consumers, especially those living in rural and underserved areas. Patients and providers enjoy the benefits of telehealth, but adoption can be hampered by a lack of digital literacy which can lead to some health equity issues. Digital literacy includes connecting to the internet, uh, using a specific web browser, downloading an app, um, updating security settings. Other barriers to telehealth adoption can include so, slower internet bandwidth speeds. Somatic providers often rely on visual observations and cues to make a diagnosis a treatment decision. So this recommendation allows providers the option to deliver somatic care using audio only when needed to enable access to care. It also supports unrestricted use of audio only for behavioral health services, which as Alana noted, um, account for the majority of telehealth visits. I do have a comment on this one. Um, with the somatic care as a somatic care provider um, and looking at the language here about uh, audio versus audio visual uh, telehealth or somatic care the fact that additional rationale will need to be documented by the provider in order to justify an audio only somatic care uh, telehealth uh, service and it's my understanding that we were going to implement this study for two years and then reevaluate. I would propose that um, for somatic care that we would be allowed to use audio only equally as audio visual and not have to justify the rationale for using, because that's going to be a barrier to audio only. And I don't think you'll get a fair evaluation of how audio only can be beneficial for the care of somatic conditions, as well as the fact that you know, as a, as a rural family doctor, I take care of a lot of behavioral health issues and manage a, a lot of that, especially as the only psychiatrist in my county is now retired. Um, and so I don't think it's a clear black and white when you say somatic care providers. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of things that we can accomplish with audio only. And I would appreciate the opportunity to have the freedom to equally use those two services without the clinician barrier of um, having to justify why I'm doing an audio only. So that, that's my stance on that suggestion for this. And um, anyway, appreciate hearing my feedback and if necessary, I'll make a motion to that effect. So I think that's a reasonable approach. I think there can be, uh, there, there are views on both sides, but this is a commission report. So if it's the commission's preference that um, the, the modif there's a modification, then I see no reason that staff would not consider that. I'd like the, the, the background of, of why, of the restriction and the reason for it. 
there's it, I mean, I can see reasons why in a somatic context, audio only is lots of time going to not, not help. What are these, what are the, the reason why we were restricting it in the first place? I thought it was because we were going to use video because people were talking about their physical complaints. Yeah, and and by and large, I think that's the, the, the underlying basis for the inclusion of it, where it's somewhat viewed as a, a, a fail first opportunity, where if it doesn't work, where the patient's preference is to not use um, audio, video, and just use audio, it would be allowed, or at the discretion of the of the treating provider who deems that the patient isn't a good candidate for using audio visual. They're struggling. Um, because they're spending too much time looking at themselves uh, on the video. Um, it does enable that, but it's a it was intended to be a process because um, what we've heard from, and we've seen in some of the literature, is that the preference in somatic care is always first and foremost, be able to put your hands on the patient, followed by being able to see the patient. Then if those two things don't aren't enabled or come to fruition, then move to the next phase. So I'm not exactly sure what the carriers specifically require in terms of the, the level of documentation. And that may be where there's some variation that probably is, is the underlying issue as opposed to the process. I think that the fundamental assumption that seeing someone on a video screen has clinical benefit, I mean, I'm not sure that's an accurate assumption. Based on- There's a reason not to let that be in the discretion of the the doctor, you know, the doctor per, per case, per patient could decide that in this yeah. instance, you know, in his or her experience judgment that it should be audio versus visual. And it, and it does say that the recommendation does allow for the provider to use their discretion. That's why I went back to, I wonder if this is a carrier specific requirement, but the provider can use their discretion and opt to treat the individual using audio only if that's their preference. Well, then if it truly this, is a Provider discretion doesn't really matter to have a you know, caveat there at all, but just, just provide equal opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could make the point both ways. To some extent, it's a guardrail and it's a, sort of a protocol that you might think about as a general process. Um, to some, that was deemed to be important, and I suppose there are others that might say that it's more of it's more of a process that has you know, complexities on their end. This is Commissioner like I'm going to echo what Dr. Brzezinski has mentioned. More documentation you have providers to do, less likely they are going to do. You know, we already have too much documentation to do. That's one of the reason it's driving physicians early retirement. So there is need to be some modification on that. I think it should be very simple where uh, we should not have too many documentation requirements. Yeah, so um, I think um, Alana, Dr. Kunis is bringing up a point that's worth mentioning. Certainly, I, I think one thing that it may be consideration is that we don't have a lot of really good research about how telehealth works, its effectiveness or its quality on the actual patient and provider experience. We have a snippet. And so if we can have some additional data provided in a claim, that identifies whether it was audio only or audio visual, we can use that in our analyses to see, for example, is there a difference in utilization of ED services following audio only versus audio visual? I'm just saying for- right. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for a lack of distinct claims for audio versus audio visual. Yeah, so I mean, I, I support having separate di uh, CPT codes for audio and audio visual. I, uh, rail against the fact that I have to document why I'm choosing one or the other. So that's my opinion as someone who's tried to use telehealth services in a rural environment, and it's hard enough just to get someone on the phone or even try to, all those barriers you talk about using audiovisual technology are real, and they are time sick, and they've driven the lack of adaption, adoption of uh, telehealth services. So I think, and also, it's not a lot. Like somatic care, it's, it's a small percentage of the telehealth services. So you're not taking a big risk by allowing us to freely choose audio or audio visual, uh, especially if we do it in the context of a two-year pilot and then re-evaluate. Re yes, I think Ben. Yeah, I mean, I do think, and I don't know that 
it's fully worked out here in terms of what the guardrails are and are there you're a rural provider you have to make the case on every instance or that's what it's been to date yeah that that we need to be more if there are if there are exemptions we should should apply you shouldn't have to reconfirm that that this will not work in oakland you know, oakland maryland every time you have a telehealth visit it's not going to work i i therefore can use audio only uh, i mean i would favor a, maybe a little bit more nuance or somatic care than just the same exception that exists for behavioral health and you know what i would say is that it could be we're talking about guardrails on a sidewalk here. You know, it's not the interstate of healthcare. You know, it's very small. So uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Risk. There are. Yeah, I am trying to think of how it's going to be a little think, more nuanced. Than one is. one concern I think that I would have is the, the do the patients know and want to pay for to go to telehealth. So now, when your doctor calls you, are you agreeing to pay now for an audio only telehealth? which with your high deductible health plan, you were paying for. So how do we know that uh, like the concern for abuse on this is not, of course, we can all in picture the good case was the doctor trying to do the right thing. They're really consulting, but uh, there's, there's the doctor down the street. We don't want to talk about who's just phoning people up. And there's like a million like visits and things like that. So the guardrails are really there, not uh, for, for the doctor down the street, who is definitely not here. But uh, that's, I think that's the, is there a level of, uh, is this what the patients are agreeing to? Uh, so the element of the patient wants audio only. Is, with these, with these telehealth department. visits, they, they really consume the, most of the resources of a real visit. There's a reception person who talks to the patient and verifies the insurance eligibility and payment. Then there's a clinical, at least in my practice, there's a clinical person who talks to them and gathers preliminary clinical data in there. So it's, it's more structured than, Hey, I just called you to tell you your cholesterol is good and hung up and I charge you a hundred dollar visit fee. Um, so I mean, it does fall under, you know, a structured encounter per se. I've got a high deductible health plan. We've gotten lately some like consultation fees tacked on to visits that were like, well, that was like five seconds. Um, so we've had to go back to unnamed physician. United is pretty favorable. And, and there may be some underlying information that comes from an additional study, which is in the recommendations as well. So I would also assert that this is a framework that's being discussed today and that um, more research, as Dr. Kunitz noted and in recommendation seven um, is included, um, there will be some shaping more likely as we go forward. This is mostly talking about what we continue with today. I think the documentation is for, could we, if we get this recommendation, could we ask that it be, would the burden of that be included in the study though? Like, um, I don't, I like, yield to our like, executive director. So uh, if it keeps this restriction, uh, the end result should be an evaluation of whether the, the burden is cost effective. I, I advocate the opposite. So remove the restriction and then reassess. You can't, but it's hard to evaluate the lack of something. We've had two years of the restriction. There's, We've had, well, I mean, Audio only has been restricted for the past two years of telehealth. Yeah. So you and Dr. Bandara are, are both uh, frustrated with it. Yes. Yes. I think doctors are probably frustrated with added administrative burdens. They have enough to deal with that. That's what many doctors are retiring, actually. That's going to get even worse. And I can tell you one thing, uh, you know, when I was on board of physician, one thing is, uh, uh, you know, there are some bad apples. I'm going to say probably 90, 95% physicians are very good. They are very ethical. 5% are going to uh, probably abuse it, but there should be a way to penalize those physicians. Mm -hmm. One thing is on the board point of view, you cannot say, well, I didn't see the patient. That's why this mistake happened. That's about the patient care. But same time, overcharging, there should be a way where we can, you know, penalize this physician, those who are bad apples. Most of them are here to patient care. So I think we have to look into this uh, carefully, especially in Baltimore, because I was on this telehealth work group with uh, David and we had a lot of discussion. Even in Baltimore, many patients don't have a broadband. They just have a cell phone, flip cell phone, where you know that's the only way they can be ac have access to uh, televisit. 
but um, there were no restrictions on audio. Yeah, part of the. So I didn't hear. There was, nothing, there was no restrictions on audio. I think it varied from there to there. That's true. So it's really as. as Ben noted, it's really very, the whole idea of this is because on the permanency of coverage, there's unevenness, there's variation amongst the payers on, on what's covered and how it's applied and what's administered. So um, that's what this is trying to do is for the time being, create evenness of the requirements. And perhaps as it gets worked out, as we were to go, if we were to go forward with this, there's a way to look at how this can be applied within less onerous, with less onerous process. I doubt that's going to happen. It only gets more complicated the more pants at the bottom. So I'm hoping that I was hoping here to advocate for some streamlining, as well as you know, it is a small volume of services. As your graphs demonstrated, that there's a lot more behavioral health adoption of this, a lot of audiovisual adoption, and I'm curious if more just audio only adoption would occur. And if that's you know, we talk about barriers to healthcare, and I mean, I frankly have stepped away from doing telehealth, because by the time I fight with the technology and my eight-year-old patient in rural Appalachia, I'm, you know, I'm halfway through my visit, and finally we just call each other on the phone and finish it. So it's, it's, it's a significant barrier, especially to the Medicare population having to try to use audiovisual technology. So, and I don't think there's a clinical benefit of seeing the patient on a screen. Significant clinical benefit. Yeah, I'm, so I, I think what we found is there's, there's just, there's a lot of, there's camps, it's divided, there's no perfect answer. Um, so I, I, I generally so, have look, to the, the procedurally what we will do is you should finish the report and then we'll have a motion on the recommendations. And then if a commissioner wants to move to modify one of the recommendations, we will hold a motion and vote on that. And that'll be the recommendation. I'll probably vote against it, but that's that's the way we would get to like yeah. Like, let's go through the process. Station. So right. why don't right. we finish Good it? Then we'll put a motion on the table. Yeah, I agree. I, I could just you know think about is there a structural modification that would say you know, the exemption on somatic care seems to be uh, an event by event, and our would we be comfortable with it? Commissioners want to go this way, add an additional or systematic exemption uh, that, that if you're in, in a rural Maryland uh, location, uh, you can for all services be be allowed somatic. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Audio Bandari's, only, Bandari's, uh, point that you know in. Very urban areas as well. I think there's, you know, just high yeah. area deprivation index, a lot of social determinants of health that are, you know, barriers to that. Problem. I'll stop you after that. All right. I will we'll end it with consensus. If it's the commission's preference, we'll continue onward. It's probably worth noting, too, that we've heard from the systems that in the daily course of care, they start first with audio video, and they pretty much said we fail first and we pivot. So it's not the preferred, but they, that's how they operationalize. I, I think that's what Dr. But, but Dr. Kinsinski will say. And then you've just cost me seven minutes of your 15 minute office visit playing with technology. Anyway, but proceed, I'll shut up. So um, the next slide, please. The um, permanency of telehealth coverage recommendation three pertains to use of remote patient monitoring and obtaining patient consent. Um, the remote patient monitoring coverage and patient consent process for asynchronous and synchronous communication varies. Harmonizing coverage and consent requirements will foster meaningful use of the technology. Next slide. Permanency of telehealth coverage four allows use of telehealth for hospice service. This recommendation supports adoption of telehealth by hospice providers, which has enabled patients to receive hospice care in place in the comfort of their home. This helps address issues pertaining to provider shortages and geographic distances that sometimes present barriers in providing quality end of life care, ensuring Expanded access to hospice providers via telehealth allows for the identification of 
critical changes in functional decline and symptoms of disease progression, enabling earlier intervention and less urgent care. Next slide. Permanency of telehealth coverage recommendation five allows use of telehealth in hospital inpatient and nursing home settings. This recommendation supports use of telehealth as a complementary modality of care for specialty consults in inpatient hospital and nursing home settings to expand access to providers, which can reduce risk factors in managing patients with chronic conditions and potentially avoid unnecessary hospital transfers in a nursing home setting. Telehealth is not thought to be equivalent to in-person care for all conditions in an inpatient or a nursing home setting. Study findings suggest the need for some guidelines around its use as interdeterminate symptoms about a patient's condition could be overlooked during virtual visits. Next slide, please. Recommendation six is to ensure communications technology complies with national privacy and security standards. Use of national standards ensures telehealth technology is implemented and operated in a consistent manner with even baseline protections for the privacy and security of PHI standard. Oh, ben, do you want to chime in? Go ahead, finish. Standards-based technologies are built upon principles uh, that enable communication and interoperability. So this this basically um, would stop FaceTime and, and just regular Zoom type communications that sprang up during the pandemic. By many clinicians initially, that this is basically resetting the underlying te technical platform to a standard-based system. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's correct. The only the only variation would be is if there was the federal government would decide to implement some extend the state of emergency or right. something like that. Or kind of going back to a standard that's correct. rather than an emergency standard where use what you can. That's correct. Kind of boy award diverse. How does that work with telephones if it's audio only? So they uh, it's, so they are actually there are actually standards around the use of different types of telephones. For example, smartphones are actually called out in the under ONC rules. So there are some um, parameters around that. And in the consent process, there there are requirements under the privacy and security rule that consumers be made aware of the risks that, that are involved in using audio. So next slide. Recommendation seven, um, this maintains what exists under the act until future study that focuses on telehealth payment levels is completed. The key questions focus on the cost and clinical effort of providers using telehealth, telehealth value, reimbursement and payment parity, and reimbursement adequacy for in-person care and telehealth services in behavioral health care. So I might just note here that this kind of ties back to where we originally started by saying the recommendations provide a framework um, for consideration for future legislation. They don't necessarily say this is it and here's the science. Where this kind of study, additional study, gets to is what Dr. Knudsen mentioned about the need for data. And it also gets to some of the points of some of the physicians are making around the effectiveness of telehealth in that process. So there is is a need to get more data if we really want to have a, an underlying framework that says, here's the decisions and here's why they're being made. Because there just isn't enough, not only in Maryland, but nationally. There's a lot of literature, but science is missing. And I think that's what we hear the data folks saying is, let's acquire more data and it will help guide decision-making. This isn't an end. This isn't an end. This is the beginning of what we're sort of talking about. So by not saying anything, what is this, what is the standard parity? So today, the, yes, that is correct. Why didn't you guys make that point? We're not. There is movement to 
study these differentials. We don't think we have the, the practice expense information, the uh, med med medical liability differentials, um, the, the work, the physician work variations that will allow us to say an ENI, a, a 10, a 99212 delivered to, you know, via telehealth is, requires more thought on the part of the physician face-to-face -face or vice versa. We don't think we have any of that nailed down yet. It's not that we need more claims. We actually need some of the, the uh, practice information to something that uh, both Dr. Mandari and Dr. Suzuki said, you know, we actually have all of these clinical office-based, practice-based components with telehealth visit, but they're put together in a different way than if I showed up in the office and said, I'm here, sit in the lobby and fill out the sheet. Like call you. I think the, I think those are the big points that, you know, and who would actually do this? You know, is it we did get a lot of pushback last session when it was even mentioned that the healthcare commission would stick its toe into rate setting. Uh, and and you know, instead we might be better off defining the parameters that payers could use if it's not done at a national level. Recall that you know, back in the late 80s, for those of us who were around at the time, you know, Bill Shaw and his colleagues at Harvard spent probably five years developing what's now the physician fee schedule. We're gonna go that route. You know, it's gonna take some time. But I think parity is a good place to work from at this present time. Next slide. Ben, can I ask you one thing? Uh, I know during pandemic, facility fee by a certain um, uh, institutions was not allowed. Is the facility fee is going to be allowable if it's a televisit or it will not be? I think that's uh, yeah, I don't think we're weighing in on that. I think that, that um, I don't think we were asked to weigh in on that. I think the payers and uh, HSCRC feel really strongly that it should not apply. That's correct. Thank you. I also think that is the HSCRC issue correct? It is an HSCRC issue. If you could advance two slides. So the next two slides include terms, some of which already exist in statute that could benefit from clarification. To be clear, the recommendation is not to replace what exists, rather to consider adding some additional language to add clarity to the definitions. Next slide. And next slide. Great. Well, this concludes um, MHC's portion of the proposed draft recommendations. I am pleased to introduce uh, David Cooney, Associate Commissioner uh, life and Health at the Maryland Insurance Administration, who will now present on the MIA's board. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and it is my pleasure to present to you today on the MIA's chapter of the study. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So the MIA was required by the Act to conduct a limited scope study of telehealth as it relates to private insurance coverage specifically, and provide the MIA's findings to MHCC for inclusion in its comprehensive report. So specifically, the MIA was required to study two topics. First, we were asked to examine how telehealth can support efforts to ensure healthcare provider networks efficiency in the private insured market. And then second, we were asked to study how changes to telehealth coverage under private insurance plans has impacted consumers' ability to receive coverage for in-person services versus telehealth services on, based on their preference. So, and then finally, because the legislature was aware that the MIA was in the process of revising our network adequacy regulations and that we were considering changes to how telehealth would be viewed in the network adequacy context, the Act also required the MIA to take the provisions of the Act into consideration when we propose revisions to our regulations. Next slide, please. So, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of just summarize and combine the next several slides. But as we studied, uh, changes in access and coverage of telehealth, we basically took a four-pronged approach. 
First, we examined all of the health insurance contracts that have been filed and approved with our agency between 2019 and 2022. Uh, in addition to that, we surveyed healthcare, um, health carriers in Maryland to get, gain some insight into administratively how they actually implement these benefits in the real world. We then analyzed uh, complaint data that we'd received from consumers and providers related to telehealth to gain insight into any challenges consumers may have experienced with telehealth. And then for the fourth part, we um, did a survey of some other state regulators across the nation to get a sense of what the national perspective was. So summarizing those findings, uh, as you might expect, we found that access to telehealth coverage under private insurance has expanded over the past several years since the pandemic. Um, a lot of these expansions were due to accommodations the carriers made during the pandemic at the request of regulators, and then some of those have been codified into the act. Uh, some of those requirements, though, do sunset um, in June of 2023. Um, the complaint data that we received um, really reflected across the board just consumer and provider requests for expansion of access to telehealth. There were no complaints related to an individual not being able to access in-person services and being steered toward telehealth. Our examination of the contracts and the provider, uh, sorry, the health carrier surveys demonstrated the same thing. We found no evidence of any restrictions on, in Maryland at least, the consumer's ability to access and choose in-person services if that was their intent. However, what we did find from some of the national data is that uh, two national carriers, at least one other state, are currently offering a product that has a telehealth gatekeeper. So it's essentially a telehealth first product where a telehealth provider manages your care as a primary care physician. And then they will refer you to other in-person or telehealth services as, um, as they determine is needed. We have not seen that in Maryland. And we did also note that some other states have actually already enacted legislation that would actually prohibit those types of plans. They're not currently prohibited in Maryland, even though we haven't seen them yet. So let's see, we skip ahead uh, a couple slides. Yes, yeah, I just, I mean, that was one of the things that I looked at in your slides, the telehealth first product. Um, I think that's, that is a concern. It needs to be looked into because if we don't have any pro prohibitions against it and then, then it comes in, a little late. Right. And when I get to the recommendations, that is one of our recommendations that the legislature at least consider that issue. So I'll, I'll get to that and talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Let me see here. Um, next slide. Go ahead, another slide. One more, and then we're caught up. Okay. So for the second phase of our study, we analyzed how telehealth can be leveraged to support network adequacy efforts. And we found strong evidence that there are many ways that telehealth can support these efforts when it's treated as a complement to rather than a replacement of in-person services. And in some of these items, um, Alana and Nikki may have already touched on a bit. But for example, we have seen that telehealth has been shown to reduce appointment no-shows, and that can have an indirect effect on improving appointment wait times. Telehealth can offer expanded after-hours care options as an alternative to in-person ER services. Telehealth can be leveraged as a triage mechanism to identify which enrollees need prompt access to in-person services at the first point of contact. Um, obviously, telehealth can help overcome travel, transportation, and mobility barriers. And then for audio-only telehealth specifically, that can help address technology accessibility barriers that we had a pretty long discussion on um, that may exist for you know, audio-visual forms of telehealth. Finally, research suggests an increasing consumer preference for telehealth over in-person services in many circumstances. This indicates that in-network telehealth services are becoming a critical basic component of an adequate network in the insurance market. Slide, please. I'm sorry, I, no, that's correct, yes. So um, we took all these factors into consideration as we drafted revisions to our network adequacy regulations. And as one of the few states nationally that currently includes express considerations for telehealth in our network adequacy regulations, Maryland is already a leader in this area. The revisions to Maryland's network adequacy regulations that will be formally proposed in the coming month or so, they will take an even more proactive approach to telehealth. This approach is intended to encourage and incentivize carriers to improve access to in-network telehealth services. The proposal will allow carriers to request telehealth credit 
which is subject to approval by the MIA, that can be applied toward meeting the travel distance standards and the appointment waiting time standards. Approval of the credit will be contingent on documentation justifying the telehealth services are actually clinically appropriate, available, and accessible in both the geographic area where the credit is being claimed and also for the particular provider specialty where the credit is being claimed. Proposal will also require all carriers to report data on telehealth utilization, even if the credit is not being requested. And what's especially important to note is that the regulations do not eliminate the requirement that a carrier must provide access to an in-network provider with a physical office location and a reasonable distance. Next slide, please. We're getting some feedback uh, uh, from someone on the phone. Please mute your phone. So based on the MIA study, we're proposing three recommendations for the legislature. First is that we're recommending that the General Assembly allows the MIA to retain the latitude currently granted under the Network Adequacy Statute, which gives us the ability to determine by regulation how telehealth best fits into the evaluation of network adequacy. In the past several years, the MIA has undertaken a very deliberative process with input from all stakeholders on how to update and improve our network adequacy regulations. We've exposed multiple pre-publication drafts for public comment and made revisions based on those comments. And then the latest draft includes very specific telehealth provisions that will allow the MIA to continually monitor and reevaluate the impact of telehealth on network adequacy. Any new legislation at this time that would restrict telehealth considerations for network adequacy would hinder the MIA's ability to determine the most effective way of leveraging telehealth to enhance network sufficiency. Next slide, please. For our second recommendation, we are suggesting that the legislature consider whether to permanently codify some of the telehealth coverage expansions that have occurred since 2019, particularly since some of these were codified into the act, but they will sunset on um, June of 2023, including um, the coverage of audio only visits in the commercial market. The MIA has noted widespread support from consumers and providers for greater telehealth coverage in the insured market. But without legislation, market uniformity cannot be ensured and carriers would not be prohibited from retracting pandemic-related expansions of telehealth coverage. Uh, next slide, please. And then for our final recommendation is for the legislature to consider whether to revise state laws to codify additional prohibitions on telehealth-only benefits or telehealth-first benefits for private insurance plans. As we mentioned, uh, we have seen legislation in this area and some other states. And we have seen that a few carriers have started to introduce these products in other states. We have not seen these products just yet in Maryland, but without legislation, carriers would be permitted to offer some of these plans in Maryland. Um, our recommendation isn't necessarily that it should be prohibited, but simply that the legislature should look at this very closely because there are a lot of policy considerations that go along with this, um, including market demands, pricing impacts, potential chilling effect on product innovation, as well as consumer convenience and patient provider preferences, because this is a product where there are certain consumers this would be appealing to. So that was um, our recommendation and uh, that concludes the MIA's portion and I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Um, I have one, it's a procedural question. There will be a motion to adopt the report and the recommendations. The recommendations that we would be adopting would be the MHCC. We're not really being asked to opine on MIAs. Not that there's anything wrong with the recommendations, but we're not being asked to opine on the MIAs recommendations. That's right. they're, 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 those are what they are. Yeah, and they are included in our report, but your points will take it. So I wanted to make sure for anybody that agrees. So yeah. points one through 13 or whatever it was that you all. Uh, so yeah, one through 12. 12, yeah. So can we go on to the, the next slide, please? Advance the slide one. There we go. So um, before we uh, read the motion or ask for ask for commissioner consideration, I just want to remind everyone um, what our executive director noted at the outset was that uh, we provided staples draft reports. We indicated that we would accept comments for November twenty third and this Tuesday. Um, stakeholder comments uh, will be included in the appendices of the MHCC report. So with that, uh, 
uh, to summarize, um, staff recommends that the commission adopt the MHCC telehealth recommendations, the NORC technical report as final for the release to the Senate Finance Committee and the House Health and Operations Committee. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the panel's presentation. Um, thank you, David, Nikki, on, and Mr. Cooney, thank you for uh, joining us. So, why don't we start with a motion to adopt the final report to preserve telehealth access act of 2021. So moved. Mr. Wang, and do I a second? Commissioner Boyle. I had one concern with a sentence, and it may be that it's just, that on page eight, we say behavioral health care providers are often limited in supply and low reimbursement makes providers less likely to participate in payer networks. Identification of and applying lessons learned from audiovisual and audio only telehealth during and after the PHE, coupled with payment and care delivery reform, are essential to address broader access issues. I feel like that was written by a behavioral health advocate and stuck into the report. And I'm just wondering if those sentences are really germane and necessary for us to delve into whether low reimbursement is the reason why we don't have providers and what payment and care delivery reforms are the commission. Is the commission now recommending? I, I'm a little concerned with those things. So, oh, go ahead. No, please thank you. I, I was just gonna say uh, on the payment side, I think it's parity for making sure that they're paid at the same level. We have there's a lot of literature that behavioral health is not reimbursed adequately in different networks, but you know, that's. I think there's a debate as to how much of it that would be a difference in the provider, like the provider availability. And, and this is not my area of expertise. I don't want to like misstate it either. I was just wondering, I wanted to be clear. We're not recommending particular payment rates or particular care reforms in this document. That was my concern on reading that. Is, yeah, we, that's Michelle. Um, Commissioner Dorton, and Commissioner Brzezinski may have a motion, but. Uh, oh, I thought you was discussing. We already have a motion. Are we discussing? Well, we're discussing the report in general. Yeah, just just a, a overview. A, a tremendous amount of work, and it was not boring anyway. Um, I thought that the minutes should reflect that. By the way, it's not a boring presentation. <laughs> we riveting. Can we? Can you all say that in general, this report and your recommendations are in the best. Um, instead for the citizens of, of Maryland. I mean, I know there's hospitals, there's doctors, there's insurance companies and everybody, rightfully, but are, do you feel comfortable that these recommendations, what we would be putting forth is in the best interest in, of the citizens of Maryland? On the technical, report? On the technical side, I, I do, and in part because we we got to talk to consumers, and we asked consumers how they felt about their experiences with telehealth, and they you, you know unanimously unanimously conveyed they would like to continue to have that option. They 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 framed it as a complement to in person care, not you know sole substitution. I, I just want to be very clear about that. It's a not as an alternative. No, as, as an alternative. I mean, okay. it, as, as a replacement. Thing. No, no, of course. Yeah. yeah. But, but another alternative for. As an alternative way care. to access care. Right. And the issue about behavioral health, historically, Maryland, as well as almost every other state in the country, has had limited access to behavioral health. And in rural communities, we rely on somatic providers to be able to provide that care. So it, it gets murky when you're looking at somatic and behavioral health, especially in extremely underserved areas like many of our rural areas in Maryland. Commissioner, you know, to Commissioner Boyle's point about telehealth is a wonderful alternative, but you know, as Struni was saying, there's some areas where some carriers are providing telehealth first now, they're using not primarily as an alternative, but almost as a replacement. And they're funneling people towards telehealth. And to your earlier point, uh, Dr. Netson, about folks whose you know, primary language is not English, they're already having a hard time accessing the system. They're less likely to access the system if you're using telehealth. And if we're in a position where we're inadvertently promoting telehealth as a first port of call, 
then what we're going to be doing inadvertently is uh, denying those folks access to care. And that's just one thing I wanted to make sure we kept in mind. We could, could we, it's a little late, but could we add a sentence that really summarizes what pointed out that we're all, I think we're all very much in favor of it, uh, but not as a replacement. And, and this is that sort of what the MIA's recommendation. Shouldn't we underscore that? Well, the idea is a, I think that there's a concern I have with you know, what the MIA is talking about is whether or not to prescribe insurance plans. People would not be allowed to pick a telehealth first plan, even if they wanted to, and it was less expensive. Some states have said that. So we're going to take that off the table. I don't care if you want to pay less to have a telehealth first. You're not allowed to do that in this state, right? When I sit and listen to the health debates and you approach this, you say, healthcare is increasing. Medical inflation far exceeds the cost of inflation year after year after year. These are your wages. This is the cost of healthcare, right? <laughs> so here comes telehealth. You think, wow, gosh, we have a tool. Maybe we can help, you know, provide the services and cut the inflation. Well, except, gosh, you got to do the same payment level for both. And you can't put any guardrails on the one and the other. And you can't require people to use telehealth, even if that's cheaper. At every element, I feel like we have come up with that. Well, it would be better to just go with the, let's make it the same price. Let's make it the same availability. Let's forbid people from using it first. And you get done, you go like, great, we will enjoy our medical inflation going forward. We have just taken what might have been a tool. And we have looked at issue by issue by issue and said, let's take the most expensive alternative. And that's the concern that I have as we approach these issues is at the end of the day, that's great. We've just gold plated it. Um, enjoy our gold plated telehealth for those that can pay. But I think mean, that's sorry. I would not want to add that sentence because I think that is a significant policy thing that should be discussed. Nobody, nobody wants to create a tiered system where people are forced into telehealth only because. Of <laughs> but I think that it's a little premature to take options off the table that people may want to pick. And we have a real problem with figuring out how to control healthcare costs. We can all point fingers at each other. I'm sure they get like the, the carriers and the doctors, and like we, but we have a real problem collectively. And that's what- There is no what greater me honor debate. for me than to stand on this floor. Well, it's three years to a pandemic. People should not use a new button. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's my soapbox. I'll, I'll get off of it, but that's my concern that I hear. And I don't necessarily disagree point by point with the different points we talk about as much as like, well, when you add it all up, how are we going to control healthcare costs? Like at the end of the day, so. Which, I, which I, I don't disagree, in, but, but controlling health costs is in the best interest of the citizens. It, it is. Okay. And, and so, I mean, I mine is a very, broad-based thought process. And I think you raise an excellent point, Commissioner, because we all we all have different hats on. It's probably more experience we're all, but at the end of the day, you're right, we're not representing different ad part constituencies as much as we may have different views on what's best for the citizens. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. So I think to Commissioner Gordon, the answer was yes. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Pazinski, can I propose an amendment for consideration by the commission to the report? And it's what I previously discussed. I think it was point two in the slides that we received regarding the, it reads, allow a healthcare provider capable of providing telehealth services using audio visual technology to deliver services using audio only technology under certain circumstances. Allow use of audio only for somatic care in the event of an audio visual technology failure or request by the patient or at the clinician clinical discretion of a treating provider and then allow unrestricted use of audio only for behavioral health care based on patient consent to receive care via audio only technology. I propose that the sentence starting allow use of audio only somatic care or somatic care uh, be parallel to the one for behavioral care. So allow unrestricted use of audio only care for somatic care based on patient consent to receive care via audio only technology. That's my proposed amendment. That's a motion. Motion, a motion, a motion to amend. A motion to amend the recommendations. Is there a second? Yes, Dr. Commissioner Bandari. Why don't we, we'll restate. you have a question? That's 
slide. Is it the slide actually? Uh, yeah, I think it's showing the slide. slide. Yeah. Recommendation. Yeah. There's 28 on here. Yeah, it's 28 on the top. Page 14. So I have to go back uh, and, slide 28. And it is and it is in the report, but page 14 in the report. So hold on a second. So it's um it's recommendation um, number two. So it's if you could uh, just back up under a little bit, Levon, that would be great. We'll sort of tell you when to stop. Oh, the number is over here. Going, keep 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 going. recommendation number two. Four, three, two, hold on. Oh, up, up, too fast, right way too fast. Speed up and go to recommendation number two. Next slide, please. All right, that's number one. And next slide. Awesome. There we go. So just add another. So basically, for sentence the second sentence starting allow use of audio only for somatic care i would say allow unrestricted use of audio only for somatic health care based on patient consent to receive care by audio only technology so we're adding unrestricted use uh, if i understand the motion is to take the sentence that starts to allow use of audio only for somatic care and basically have it be the same sentence as the next sentence for behavioral health care. That is correct. Yeah. So basically strike the second sentence and rewrite it as allow unrestricted use of audio only for somatic care based on patient consent to receive care via audio only. Is it just a, if it's approved, it's just amending that last sentence to add um, somatic care addition to being able to that would be another way to get there yeah so can i ask a question about the unrestricted use because i read this and i was going to bring it up we don't mean unrestricted here in terms of like there's plenty of restrictions we're just talking unrestricted here audio versus video right that's correct not unrestricted. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> i'm not advocating that but i know that i, I, know. I wanted to be clear because the word unrestricted is kind of a, a hot word that's around oh there we go i'll, I'll throw on the word harry <laughs> Audio yeah, yeah, and yeah, audiovisual yeah, parity. Yeah. That's what that's what I'm asking for. We should just make clear in our recommendations. Equity and inclusion. We talked about HIPAA and all those things. We're still... uh, okay. So does everyone understand the motion? And does anyone want to discuss it? I already made my speech about cost, and I would keep it the way it is and collect the data. So I, but if, I won't repeat. My I would speech. just ask. Chairman, that is this uh, is and are you comfortable with this change? Can you speak up a little? Hey, I mean, because in all fairness, if you if you're not, we all know it. Uh, and I mean, together, at least knowing we have a difference between what the commission wants and what the staff. Wants. So I'm not trying to. I would favor a I more am. nuanced exemption. I. I understand philosophically what uh, Commissioner Brzezinski is saying. I would favor a more narrow exemption uh, based on you know, provider location, practice, population, et cetera, can demonstrate um, they can't deliver care, that they don't have to go through this one off, one off, one off, that if it, they get a systematic um, demonstration, Based on limitations, you know, probably defined by HCC or MA, that they can't deliver audio video, that they then automatically qualify for giving delivering audio only care. I think that is more in the spirit with what we found than simply, I think if we we take out a more limited restriction on somatic care altogether, we kind of have undercut a lot of the work we've done, you know, frankly. Um, I, I appreciate what Dr. Sinsky is saying. I just say make it practice situational. If your practice can demonstrate we can't deliver somatic audio video care, then 
then based on fair standards, not established by a payer, but established by community, you can go to audio only all the time. I, I think Ben, that is going to create more complex more complexity. The reason is, let, let's say I practice in Annapolis. I have a patient coming from Eastern Shore. I have to pick and choose which patient should be do audio only. More wording we add, less likely encourage me to use more uh, televisit with them. Then I will bring everybody to office. I will say, you know, it's making my life difficult. My staff doesn't know who applies, which patient is still applicable, which patient is not applicable. It's going to create more problem. Yeah, I, I'm talking about it on a practice wide, you know, practice basis. You make a demo, you get a demonstration that you have a limitation um, along some of the dimensions you've outlined for a but then you get away from it. So, sure. Is it worth, you can do it now, or would it be worth tabling and having the, the staff consider it, consider the, the, the comments and recommendations today, and then? Pose a rewrite that we could uh, vote on the next meeting. Or would you rather just do it now? Uh, we have a motion and a second. We have a motion. I think under Robert's rules, the movement could withdraw the motion, but short time, we probably need to vote on it. Do not withdraw. Say, do not withdraw the motion. You have time for another month. The reports do what to say. I would like to be that. Uh, because we are, as a, a I'm not know. comfortable with. I mean, I won't take offense if we discuss and vote. That's that's why we have due process. See what the collective input is. Those who are charged with making a decision. I have one more question. You know, in our draft uh, recommendation number three. It says exclude follow up provision for behavioral health care services. Does that mean behavior health televisit provider doesn't need to have in-person visit as in case of somatic? Somatic, it says uh, six months prior to that televisit, there should be in-person and 12 months subsequently, there should be in-person. So is the behavior health is exempted from that? I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Bidoui, is this part of the motion that we have to change the other recommendations? I don't want to get us diverted. No, 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 no. Like no, I thought right. we have already taken care of that. No, it's oh, not part of no. that. Yeah. And, and, um, so the chair? We, does everyone still have the motion? Before we go on to a different topic, we can talk about the report. Let's let's close out the motion. Why don't we take a vote on Dr. Pazinski's motion? So all in favor. Can I make one, can I make one comment system. before we go forward? Yes. Okay. Can I restate? Can yes, we, and there with express there. ourselves about how we're going to vote. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we should. You're right. I mean, I don't want to cut short discussion on the motion. I just want to focus on the motion so that we can get through the end of that of it. So, um, Doctor Bendari, did you have something you wanted to say on the motion? I'm sorry. No, I'm fine. No, I did though. It's so great. Great. Let's go ahead. Yeah, I'd have to say that I I feel for the physicians and their position in terms of the. The complications that this makes for their practice, but I have to say that 30 years of dealing in Medicare payment has indicated that this is just wide open for fraud and abuse. And the idea of, yeah, uh, this just is paying for phone calls in a way that is against all, all kinds of stuff. Randy's making a point about the trust fund and the taxpayers, and that's absolutely correct, but this is also. I, I feel for you, but you don't have my vote on this one. Definitely not. Um, it's just too wide open a gate. And I'm afraid it's providers that has made payers cynical in this area too many times, too many years. Thank you. Are there any other commissioners who would like to speak? Uh, only that I uh, agree with Dr. O'Grady's uh, <clears throat> final conclusions, not not because I understand the thing he's talking about from that standpoint, but I, I'm a, I'm very strong after all this time that um, that that um, that we support the recommendation of the uh, of the administ uh, of our administration here, um, having done that much 
I don't see anybody jumping up and down to say, yes, we missed that or something. So I'm going to uh, vote against my colleagues uh, um, voting to change it. This is well. something that in, um, I think my understanding is that in the study that's coming up, I mean, I, I know you can't be qualitative, but is this something that can be studied? I, I mean, I, I would be very uncomfortable to vote either way. <laughs> but, excuse me, but I think that the other physicians make a good point, but I, I, I would be leadership. Is that within the scope of what's going to be studied, the administrative burden? So I think, so actually, I, I have executive director. It looks like. So I think it's yet to be determined if the commission would study in the near future. I mean, we are recommending that we conduct a study, uh, but the legislature has to do it. Now, we could, the commission does have broad authority. We could, we could just do it, but I think it'd be better to have the legislature tell us to. Um, than to just do like a, a study. So, but I, I would expect that it would be seriously considered. I can't say that it would have to go ahead and do it. But within the study that we're proposing to the legislature, this issue would be fairly within the scope yes, of that. Yes, that correct? would be fairly within the scope. I, I think it. And to speak to Dr. Knudsen's point earlier, you know, this is not saying that the billing codes are identical for audio versus audio visual. My motion, my motion does not say to have like a single billing code, but yet, you know, I support collecting discrete data of what are audio only and audio visual uh, visits. I think that's valuable. Are there any other commissioners? Okay, with, with that, I'll call the question. The question is on the motion to amend the report to have Dr. Zinsky's change. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. So I got uh, Commissioner Bandari, Commissioner Pazinski. Did I hear another aye? All opposed? Opposed. I counted four votes no. Counting Commissioner O'Grady on the phone. Is there anyone else on the phone besides Commissioner O'Grady who voted no? I will assume the rest of the commission abstains, which I believe means that. The commission... <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, so it doesn't pass the report. We'll come up back to the motion as is, but I just want to thank Commissioner Bozinski. Like, look, it was a good discussion. I would like to see more of. Like, we're all trying to get to the public interest in the Maryland, and we should have this discussion. And people should raise these issues. Well, I will phone up on Robert Schulz of order as needed to get it out, but. But I, we should have more of that, and I appreciate it. As much as I respect the work of, you know, the staff and all that, you know, if we're here just to rubber stamp what they no, present to we us, are not. we're not. By that's so. that's why I'm expressing. We're not here. We're here to exercise our and the judge judgment for the interests of the citizens of Maryland. Great, Mr. Chairman, and just add, it's a wonderful process. I wonder if in the future, because you know, we are driven by the December first deadline for reports, and we can't play it. But I would have liked to see, after this great discussion we had today on the Great Exchange of Views, the ability to go back, digest, to look at this and not have time pressure to say we do have an extra cushion of a month or whatever it is. So we could come back to the next meeting, having had a chance to digest, to look at it, and then form a discussion. Maybe we could all get on the same page. I have a question for uh, Commissioner Sergeant, Chair Sergeant, and Commissioner Grady. What, how do you think we should put the gear, uh, guardrails to minimize this fraud? What is your suggestion? That's what we need to look into that. What makes the you know, insurance companies and other regulatory authorities to make it more comfortable, there will be less fraud? Any suggestion on that? I think the report that we're recommending is going to include appropriate use of services like we're actually recommending a study of the two-year data that will include those kinds of questions. And I would love to, one of the reasons for the two-year study is I'd love to have a shift from we're afraid and everyone else is afraid to we have some data and either it's true or it's not true or we can all come to some consensus. So um, I'm hopeful that to me, at least, I'm hopeful that the data is going to help with that. I don't have an answer on today's information as to exactly what. 
Thank you. So is there any further discussion on the report? Now we're back to just adopting the report. Does anybody have anything they wanted to say or add on the um, telehealth report? With that, I will call a motion to adopt the report and recommendations. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Aye. But one abstention. No, I don't hear any opposition. Okay, the report passes. We have it. Thank you all. Thank you for the presentations. And the minutes will reflect that it was not the least bit boring. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been boring my whole life, so I. And item number seven. Mandated health insurance services evaluation, health insurance cost sharing, physical therapy parity with primary care services, House Bill 975, Senate Bill 725. Insurance Article 15-1501, Annotated Code of Maryland, requires the commission to evaluate the medical, social, and financial impact of proposed mandated health insurance service. <laughs> failed to pass during the preceding legislative session. Staff received a formal letter of request from the House Health and Government Operations Committee to evaluate legislation that was introduced as House Bill 974 and Companion Bill, Senate Bill 725 during the 2022 session, but failed to pass. Consistent with Insurance Article 15-1501, it's their practice to have MHCC assess such proposed mandate before considering the adoption of a new mandated service or coverage if introduced in a subsequent session. MHCC staff contracted with Barry Dunn, an actuary consulting firm, to evaluate the considerations of HB 974 slash SB 725, prohibiting commercial health insurers from imposing cost-sharing physical therapy PT services that is greater than the cost-sharing for primary care services. Tyler Brandon from Barry Dunn will now present their findings on this study, and staff asked that the commission approve this report for submission to the General Assembly by December 1st. Tyler? Thank you. Yes, this is Tyler Green. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Great, fantastic. I'd much prefer to be there in person, but uh, we'll do it this way and um, uh, hopefully uh, everything will go okay. So yes, great. We've got the title slide for the presentation. So yes, I am a senior health economist with Barry Dunn, and I'm here today to present you the findings from our mandated benefit review, which um, uh, you've got kind of the, the brief background on that. This is a mandate that deals with cost sharing parity with primary care services. And next slide, please. So just by way of background, um, we already got it covered that uh, Barry Dunn was hired to uh, perform the mandated benefit review. And there are three major areas uh, as a part of every mandated review. Um, so we are answering a number of sort of considerations and questions, regardless of the kind of mandate this is. So, this is a cost-sharing mandate, but the same questions would apply to a more traditional insurance mandate that would change the scope of services covered under a benefit design. Um, in some cases, the answers to the questions are at some level go without saying, but we're still required to go through those and, um, and we'll do so today. Uh, in terms of the resources we drew upon in doing the review, we obviously talked to the MHCC staff who were very helpful and answered our questions about um, both the legislation, how it would fit within the Maryland context and insurance laws there. Uh, we relied heavily on the Maryland Medical Care Database. And um, I think you guys are familiar with this, but it is an anonymous claims database that is, is very insightful when you're looking at healthcare costs and utilization. And Barry Dunn has used these, these all payer claims databases in a number of states for similar purposes, um, including my home state of New Hampshire, where we had one of the first APCDs in the country. Uh, we did rely heavily on published literature to provide insight um, about the uh, mandated review. We did do a carrier survey. Um, we asked them a bit about uh, existing benefit designs and potential changes that might take place in the administration of the benefit should legislation like this pass and the mandate become law. We did also meet with the Maryland chapter of the American Physical Therapy Association and were able to answer questions and ask questions and they provided some additional documentation that we considered as a part of the review. Next slide, please. So just to clarify, you had companion bills that, um, that moved forward but didn't pass, uh, and they would restrict cost sharing for physical therapy services to primary care levels. In other words, they would lower the cost sharing due from the patient for physical therapy services and basically reduce that barrier to care. 
It does apply to all the three major cost sharing types, deductibles, coinsurance, and copays. Although, as you can imagine, most of the patient payments to PTs are in the form of copays. Very important, it does not change the scope of covered services. So in doing this mandate review, we're, we're answering a lot of questions about physical therapy, even though the actual mandate is about cost sharing as it relates to physical therapy. Um, so there is sort of a little bit of confusion here in the way we respond to it, but we are treating physical therapy in the mandate, mandate itself in much the same way. Um, there are no additional limits in the legislation on the administration of the benefit. That means that insurance carriers are free to do what they do today in terms of controlling costs. Um, they may use prior authorization. They may use narrow networks. Um, often they have very specific criteria for what's considered medically necessary. And no surprise, there are normally limits on the number of visits you have in your benefit design. They would be free to impose additional requirements in these areas should the mandate pass because the legislation is just about cost sharing. Next slide, please. Uh, so we're getting right to the financial results. And um, this is part of that, that actuarial analysis heavily relied on those claims data. And we did use 2019 as sort of that, that base data year because that was considered to be most reliable. Clearly the pandemic was influencing 20 and 21 and 2019 trended forward is probably the best representation of what we would see in 2024 which is what we assumed would be the earliest this legislation could become effective if it were reintroduced this year and, um, and had a start date beginning in 2024. So um, typical of an actuary analysis, there's, there's some range in the estimates. And looking at that low scenario, you're looking at about 15 cents per member per month, up to about 21 cents per member per month. And we do these things on a, on a rate like that, a per member per month rate, because it's comparable to premiums adjust for membership. And um, if you think about kind of national premiums of closer to, to $600 per member per month, and even in Maryland where your premiums are quite low in the exchange of, you know, three to 400, it's, um, it's a relatively small amount that we're just looking at in terms of this cost sharing mandate. We took uh, different considerations for the cost trend um, during the time frame and looking at between zero and up to about 6%. Uh, we do feel as though uh, having lower cost sharing and reducing that barrier will result in greater use of physical therapy services. We do also recognize that physical therapy can be a less expensive um, treatment option versus somewhat more complex and involved care. Regardless, we do feel as though there is going to be some people who are obviously healthier may use PT services when they wouldn't have otherwise had any other care. And um, all that contributes to a general utilization increase um, of about two cents per member per month. So looking at 2024, we're looking at a range between that low scenario and the high scenario of about 17 cents per member per month up to about 28 cents per member per month. Next slide, please. And going through that the medical and the social evaluation are uh, big parts of a mandate review. And, um, and answering all of the considerations and questions that we do as a part of that. The first is just um, responding to whether or not physical therapy is recognized by the medical community and the public as being effective and a good option. And certainly the, the evidence does support that is the case. Um, there's also evidence that does show a decreased risk of advanced imaging, um, physician visits, injections, and very popular, very interesting in recent years, it's just this finding around opioid medications and PT being potentially a good alternative and reduced use of opioid medications. Generally speaking, patients are pretty satisfied with their physical therapy care. We do expect demand to continue to be strong, um, and that's driven by people who do have disabilities, um, age-related issues, which may be less a consideration for a commercially insured population um, because there is a ceiling on that, but um, cardiovascular disease is driving it. And interestingly enough, um, a lot of patients who have been intubated due to COVID benefit from, from physical therapy after. And I'm sure there are other um, applications as well for COVID patients. There was a 2017 study that did conclude that PT is underutilized, at least in part due to the co-pays imposed per visit. This led to a, a, um, a, an approach by Geisinger Health Plan to come up with a PT bundle that um, had one copay for five visits. 
And as you can imagine, PT is, is, is a bit different than some other medical care services that you may only get occasionally. Uh, people are getting the services often a couple of times a week, and uh, the copay is maybe more of a factor or deterrent than they might be for other types of care. This particular model did result in, in patients having a reduction in emergency department in physician visits after about six months. Next slide, please. Looking at um, health insurance benefits as they relate to, to physical therapy. Um, no surprise, again, I think it is generally a covered benefit. That's true even with uh, self-insured employers that are, are paying a carrier as a third-party administrator to, to administer health insurance benefits. Those employers would have a choice about whether or not to include physical therapy and cost-sharing levels um, and not generally not be subject to state law, um, but they do tend to include physical therapy. Co-payments for physical therapy are typically twice the amount for primary care services. Um, carriers did indicate they use uh, some of the main tools that we've already talked about and they're listed here to control costs and encourage utilization in certain ways. When we asked about whether or not they would consider using those tools more extensively, should this mandate pass, we had one carrier that suggested they prefer not to employ anything else. So another carrier that said, yes, we would consider all of these options to control costs. It's important to realize that um, anytime you impose an administrative measure like some of these listed here, it, it does create a, a certain amount of member and provider friction. So clearly a carrier is in a position where they need to make the bis best business decision um, when they come up with some of these tools and put them in place. It's also important to remember that despite the, the cost projections we've given you, premiums reflect an array of specific benefit decisions. And there are a number of things going on, um, everything from the underlying health status of a population to new federal or state laws, or even consumer preferences. I think what employers or individuals might want out of their health insurance. Clearly everybody is looking for the most robust benefit design but they're also looking for that, that cost point. And to an extent, the carrier is trying to meet a certain price point, they're going to make compromises in the benefit design. So to the extent you might pass a law like this in Maryland and increases the richness of physical therapy, uh, there may be an offset someplace else um, where weaker benefits could show up, at least to the extent that uh, a carrier is trying to meet the same price point. We do not feel as though there are significant administrative costs with, um, with a mandate like this as long as there's enough time for the insurance carriers to implement it using their regular cycle when they update policies, claims processing systems, and benefit designs. Um, so I think that uh, the legislation were to pass with uh, kind of an effective date at some point in the future, probably more so on the calendar year. Um, clearly, if the legislation will become effective the day it's signed, then the carriers are already got products out there, they've got their systems set up, and they have to make rapid changes to all those things and that could be very expensive from an administrative point of view. Next slide, please. There was a consideration for whether or not people with lower physical therapy cost sharing levels, think lower co-payments, would be less expensive as a population overall because they have better access to physical therapy. And I think in order to answer a question like that, you've got to do a pretty involved research study one that looks, like, looks at medical charts, it looks at patient outcomes, it looks at how the populations change. But we did perform an analysis looking at the overall costs as well as the physical therapy costs of the populations that had different co-payment levels. And what we found is that the people who had the lowest co-payment levels and the highest co-payment levels were the most expensive populations. And that was true for both PT and all costs and that was true both in 2019 and in 2020, despite the pandemic. So this finding um, perhaps raises more questions than it does provide answers. And it's important to, re to remember that healthcare costs are driven by a lot of things and benefit design choices are also driven by a number of different factors. For example, um, people who tend to have more complex healthcare needs tend to choose health insurance benefit designs that are richer with lower cost sharing because they intend to use their health insurance and that may be a factor as much as anything else. We did find evidence that physical therapy is a good substitute for a more expensive service. Um, and uh, there is a question in the mandate review about the impact on the cost of the service should the mandate pass and become law. 
And this is probably a, a more appropriate question when you're thinking about a service that insurance doesn't cover today. The patient pays for it out of pocket. They're going to be very price sensitive. And then it becomes covered by insurance and insurance pays for it. And perhaps the price goes up. When it comes to physical therapy, which is already a covered benefit, and you think about the fee schedules that go along with physical therapy services and are paid to providers, that's largely independent from any sort of cost sharing that's due from the member. So we do not feel as though there's going to be an impact on those fee schedules should the mandate pass and cost sharing requirements change. However, to the extent that a carrier is potentially paying more for physical therapy services, think in terms of more in terms of the percentage of the allowed amount, they may look for options to control those costs and certainly, as they review fee schedules from year to year, um, they may consider the passage of the mandate um, with updates to that fee schedule, uh, but that we do not feel as though there'd be a direct impact on the cost of the services. One of the other considerations is what is an employer's or an individ individual's ability to purchase insurance. And clearly, this just goes back to the cost of health insurance overall and uh, their ability to, to, to pay the premium, find enough value in the, the price point in the package that's provided. And while this mandate is, is relatively low cost compared to some other that you may consider, um, you know, really just in that, that about the 25 cents per member per month, it's also important to remember that there is an analogy about sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And, um, and certainly that should be something that could be considered uh, with legislation like this. Next slide, please. I would just like to recognize some of the other folks from Barry Dunn that participated in this project. And, uh, and Jennifer Elwood and Larry Hart are also attending today and can answer any questions that, um, uh, that I cannot, uh, I would not be the best person to answer. Um, and then next slide. Just an opportunity for questions and discussion. Hopefully that's helpful. There is obviously the report that goes along with the presentation. Any questioners have any questions? I have two, um, there are two points that I'd like to have seen in the report that I wanted to raise because they're not, since it's a cost sharing change, it's not an addition of a benefit. I, I agree with you that it could increase the cost of the insurance, but you're moving costs between the member. But here, here's the points that I wanted to make, to make is in the individual and small group market, you have plans at metal levels, bronze, silver, gold. Right. So a bronze plan is a 60% actuarial value, meaning the insurance pays 60% of the cost of the insurance actuarially, uh, like sort of on average, and the members pay 40%. In that world, when you say mandate, you must reduce cost sharing over here, then the actuaries all go back and they look at their plans. And it's not a matter of imposing additional restrictions necessarily. It's a matter of now you've just squeezed the paw of the balloon dog and the tail is going to grow because you have to have that 40% actuarial value. So part of the analysis on whether this is a good idea is who else is paying more cost sharing as a result for other services? It's right. And then especially, yep. this is especially a problem individual market where you sell so many bronze plans at 60% value. If everybody had a platinum plan at 90% actuarial value, there's so many different ways to get there. But um, the individual and small group markets so the folks primarily affected by a Maryland benefit mandate. I would have liked to see some some note in there that it's not just is it good or bad. It's what what does everyone collectively have to give up to get lower costs on physical therapy? Who who is going to pay more for other things to maintain the actuarial value? Does that make sense? It actually does. And in the report, there is a discussion of kind of the meta levels and sort of a, a carrier's position with those um, trying to kind of maintain the benefit designs within those metal levels. And uh, I think probably everybody's aware, but, but as you get richer in the metal designs, the, uh, the cost sharing tends to go down. The um, sort of the good news that kind of goes along with that is carriers have a little bit of flexibility around that particular sort of 60% or 70% or 80%. And this is considered sort of a de minimis amount that um, the benefit designs can vary slightly. And just think sort of there's a kind of a calculator that goes along with it but the exact amount, they're, 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 there's a little bit of flexibility. And it generally runs from about 1% up to about 5%. So even at that 1%, if you're thinking about what equates to, to 1% when we're talking about our premiums, um, well, if you think about a $600 premium, it's you know, that's $6 per member per month. Even at the $300 premium level, that's $3 per member per month. 
So to the extent a carrier is already operating right at that threshold, in other words, two cents higher, they're going to be above kind of the, the, the maximum permitted in the benefit design, then that's a scenario where the carrier is absolutely got to find another way where they're going to reduce the benefits to keep things budget neutral. Um, but at least with this mandate, it's not as, as large as potentially others could be. Yes. No, one of the one of the concerns, of course, is if you have a 58 percent to 62 percent range, as they're saying, right? So you're seeing value. But guess what the pricing is at 58 percent versus 62 percent. So if you want to sell less expensive insurance, you're going to be inclined to trying to achieve 58 percent EV value because uh, the bronze plans are for people who are trying to pay as little as they can get um, on the exchange. I think that yeah. I believe individual exchange, the bronze is the most sold level and in the small group market i think silver which is 70 60 percent 70 percent i apologize EV value is the most i could be wrong um, yeah so I, today, i'd was, like to uh, i do like to remind people that carriers are, are trying to come up with benefit designs that people want to buy and that means compromises between the value of the benefit design and the cost of it and um, but certainly yeah the offsets are an important consideration with any type of a mandate particularly one like this because at some level, it's prioritizing potentially one type of design versus another. The, the second point feeds into that, which is a, there is a reason why we might want primary care to be the cheapest cost sharing for member to use that's independent of other things. So one of the, my first reaction to reading the report is we're, we're assuming primary care cost sharing is a fixed, but there's a simple answer to like, well, gosh, you've got to make primary care cost sharing the same. You could just double the copay for primary care physicians. Like, look, parity. Um, so, but there's a good policy reason why we would want people to see their primary care doctors easily. And I can tell you that it's very hard to make a bronze level plan where you don't have to wind up restricting primary care because you have to put the 40% actual actuarial value somewhere. So I worry that watering down the benefit of seeing the primary care doctor inexpensively could have policy uh, even though without saying anything negative about physical therapy could have negative consequences if you wind up raising cost sharing on primary care docs. Or if you wanted a plan that had zero cost sharing on a primary care doctor, that essentially means you have to also be willing to have zero cost sharing on um, a uh, physical therapy. And there are some plans I think you could still probably at the gold level come up with a zero primary care cost sharing. I like the balloon dog analogy. It's, it's very much a very complicated balloon dog. <laughs> and Adam, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything in the report that adjusts that, but I, I thought that it should be a concern, policy concern, that if we make primary care more expensive for the member, that may be in the long run more expensive for everyone. Interesting. So uh, this is a, a suggestion to the uh, commissioners. Typically, on the mandate reports, most we see a technical flaw. We don't jump in and say, change this or change that. Uh, but we do uh, always send a letter um, to the chairs of the committees, you know, kind of reflecting, we're asked to do this. This is you know, their assessment. Uh, and we keep, you know, our, the commissioner's views, you know, are then conveyed in a letter to the chairs. Like, you know, no, and typically, it, Includes a sentence such as this that individual, any individual mandate by itself uh, is not going to have a significant impact, but cumulatively, the impact of mandates can be quite substantial. We've also used it to, to raise other issues over the course of the last decade that you know, are, are, are not raised by the during the actuarial assessment. And that probably would be an approach I would recommend here. I think the philosophical question that you know we spent a half hour talking earlier about primary about you know care philosophically, do we want to establish parity for one service against primary care? Because you know that is the quidential um, slippery slope that everyone will want parity with primary care, and you know are we all absolutely confident there's commission absolutely confident that we want to make you know that that pronouncement or you know do we want to be very narrow uh in 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 warn the legislature or it's up to you it's up to the commissioners to make that call you know we draft the letter we typically circulate that letter you know to try to 
get consensus among all the commissioners on that. But that's what I would favor in this case is to raise some of the, you know, some of the uh, several of the outstanding issues, both for and against you know, doing something. So you will develop a letter for us to react to. Yes, that's what I would I would recommend that staff would develop a letter uh, highlighting some of the questions that were raised here. You know, I think the, so. The, so our our responsibility today in this meeting is to receive this report and then at a later date give a response. Or are we voting on a response now? I think we are voting on a response with the understanding that the staff will draft a cover letter on the report explaining. Mm -hmm. You know, explaining the commission gotcha. thoughts on, on this. I have, I took a lot of, it raised a real, a lot of suspicion that they're using the parity with primary care co-pays. And to me, in sort of the medical political realm, it seems parity with primary care may be a longer trajectory they're looking for to replace primary care. And I don't think that, although I'm a huge proponent of physical therapy, they are not a primary care provider. They do not need and I don't think it brings the same value to the healthcare system that effective by preparing care does. So I, you know, on one level, um, you know, disagree with the, uh, you know, the verbiage of parity with primary care, at least on the, the copay level. You have any concerns on the report? And I also have a secondary concern about the slippery slope. You know, what about occupational therapy, speech therapy? Are you Pulmonary rehab. So these are, you know, non-provider services. These are allied health services. So anyway. I, mean, I think the idea of lower copay would be my sense is commissioners well, might endorse that. The term parity has to be thought of carefully. Good. Just curious from a terminology standpoint. <clears throat> this was something that <laughs> we were asked to make happen. We went to an outside source to do it that our staff really has not so to speak been involved would we are, are do we vote to approve this or do we endorse sending it forward back to the legislature what's the appropriate motion in your mind i mean i think we approve it to go to the legislature we're approving everything that's in it no we're we're approving the report to go to the legislature and oh so we're just uh, Passing it through. We are directed to um, conduct these studies under the health, health that, insurance, the insurance article 15. Well, are we approving or are we providing recommendations? We I, are. We're passing it along, but we're not endorsing it. I guess. That, not, that's what I'm trying endorsing. to understand what we're doing. We are passing we're on the well. report as it through. meeting the requirements of the law. Right. Okay. Retweets are not endorsements. And I, I think Ben's approach was in the past where we've had a concern that doesn't seem to be in the report as a commission. We might we, might we comment on it as we send it forward. Okay. It, it is typically not sure. these letters that uh, go out typically you know, have a and pronouncement that you know, keep in mind that the, that the more mandates you add, you know, all of them, it's hard to oppose a mandate. They all seem on their face you know, pretty important. And, you know, I, have some sympathy with what physical therapists are doing, but I want to be sure that um, you know that we convey a balanced perspective. The parity issue is one that come back come back to haunt the commission in ways that are unanticipated. Would there would anyone be opposed to a letter that says we are concerned about the impact on primary care? Like we don't have to be detailed about it, but it's what's in there is that we're concerned primary about care as well as other. Allied health services. I don't know. So, which, you know, speaks like that. Yeah. I, I have concerns about this and I do not support or endorse this legislation. I you know, stand against it. I'm not sure if that's part of what we're to do here today, but I agree the report was excellent. I thought the analysis was great. It really framed it well. I really appreciate your thoughts about the, you know, where else are they going to get the, the money from? But as a concept, I really disagree with that. Primary care parity is copay of parity, especially with some of the concerns that why not just raise primary care co-base. If the sense that the commissioners who are present are somewhat opposed to this or strongly opposed to it, is that something we just put in, into the letter? It would be unusual for us to take a position on legislation that it failed last year. It hasn't come back yet, and we're reporting on what its impact. We have an expert reporting on its impact. Probably shouldn't 
in the pie. Specific yeah. legislative positions, but if, I, I personally, like from both commissions, I would be happy with just we're raising the concerns because yeah. it could yeah. be further yeah. discussed, and it's not. It means we're not endorsing. I don't have any comments. I don't have any comments. Uh, did, did did you want to say something? Yeah, it was just I'm I'm, I'm most comfortable. I, I think the main point here is what you brought up. However, you want to think about that as the the actuarial um, uh, no free lunch or zero sum game. Uh, that that's anything that the legislature should be thinking without kind of either opposing or supporting this. Uh, you know, I was in the middle of looking at plan choices a little while ago for myself, and you can see you know things that are like the price of insulin part of that clearly is affected by other things that are mandated to be done so whether it's not so much kind of where we think of it uh but it's it's that idea of this is a zero-sum game unless you're going to start raising premiums and therefore you there's going to be gifts somewhere else can, can you still hear me or have i locked up yes, yes. No, and it makes oh, okay. sense so my sense is we we modified the motion to have a motion to approve the mandated health insurance services evaluation, health insurance, cost sharing, physical therapy parity with primary care services, hospital 975 and Senate Bill 725 report uh, with a request that the MACC draft the cover letter, like following our expressing our concerns. Yeah, yeah. or expressing you know, the views of the commission itself, right? So there may be some people that want to add don't strongly endorse, but I think what I'm hearing is you know, that strongly concerned, yeah. strongly opposed, or concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Opposed is what my heart is. But, right. I'll use polite language. Whatever we're allowed to say, to the extent we're allowed to say it, whatever's best. We can, I think Commissioner yeah. Wang had made the motion. Do I have a second? Commissioner Jordan? Any further discussion? None. None. Well, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you all. We only have one more action item. Then the item number eight. Twenty twenty three MCDB data submission manual, as stated in the Code of Maryland Regulations, Section ten twenty five oh six fifteen for submission methods. The Maryland Healthcare Commission shall provide an annual medical medical care database, MCDB, submission manual. By November 21 of each year, the manual is to be used by payers, data submitters, for the reporting periods in the subsequent year before posting the manual on the commission website presented to the commission by MACC staff seeking approval of the new manual. Kenneth Yates Trotman, Director, Center for Analysis and Information will present. And you have the floor. Thanks very much, um, the Deputy Commissioners, uh, Chair, Sergeant. Next slide, please. <laughs> So every, um, so every year, um, the Maryland Healthcare Commission is required to, uh, to uh, post this, um, will make the submission manual available to payers on or before November 21st of every year. Now, this manual will be used by payers, you know, for the upcoming subsequent year in 2023 to guide their um, data submission. And also we're required to um, you know, uh, post this manual on the commission website. Next slide, please. So as an overview of the MCDB, has um, basically uh, you know, three uh, main uh, data types. So um, for the commercial data, yeah, we collect um, information from, from private players who uh, have at least 1,000 total lives or more as uh, depicted or recorded at the Maryland Insurance Administration. And these, uh, these um, private board entities include life and health um, insurance companies and, uh, and HMOs, also to party administrators, PMs and uh, behavioral health administrators, and also uh, qualified health plans and qualified dental plans. Although these, these qualified plans are not su subjected to the 1,000, uh, at least 1,000 lives or more, they're required to report. So the kind of information that, that uh, we collect from these uh, commercial uh, players, uh, we, can, we can collect uh, enrollment data in terms of uh, membership of the eligibility plan. What that means is that if you have health insurance, you can that, um, that file. 
And all of those people who are in that eligibility fund, if they have incurred a claim, they will be, uh, whether it be from, from, a, from a physician, office, or facility, or when you go to pharmacy, dental, um, those, um, those claims would be, uh, would be recorded in those uh, claims files. I must I must caution that the dental file is uh is, or, or file is uh, is very small. It is uh is only uh, associated with the qualified dental plan. You know, and also um, if you do down on that, uh, most of that information is for pediatric settings. So very 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 limited. The, the other in, the information that we have we have a provider directory as well, uh, which houses uh a provider ID and uh, tax ID and also the First name and last name, API, and also the credential books and those, um, uh, providers. We also have the, uh, the Medicaid data and see on the fever service that we get from uh, Medicaid through uh, the Hilltop Institute and also the Medicare fever service, which we acquired through the state uh, agency. Next slide, please. So, what is changing for the 2020? First off, um, we, we attempt to split out that copay and co insurance field into the co insurance and copay field. And um, in, in the, um, in the uh, presentation that we just had, the Barry Dunn um, were hoping to really um, have these, uh, these fields split out. So, so we think that is a good idea to, to really, um, to really um, separate these two fields so that um, even for the studies in magic studies will be. Um, have a more, more enhanced um, study quality. For the institutional services, we are reverting back to the 2019 and prior uh, requirements of the secondary ICD-10 procedure codes. We have, we have suspended um, these, these um, codes uh, uh, back in uh, 2017. The reason for that is that, um, well, first of all, we did not have a threshold on, on these secondary codes and they were poorly reported. Those of our large, our large carriers were not even uh, reporting on this information. And when we put a threshold there on 2017 uh, to, to, uh, to ask them to, to begin to pay attention to report this information, it was really disastrous. You know, they were having wrong, wrong information there. So what our previous um, contractor did, we, uh, we, we searched to see what other states are doing, Colorado, Utah, and they were only collecting uh, the primary uh, ICD tech. But, um, but, but our friends from the former sister agency, HSCSE, said that, um, that those codes, those secondary codes, they're crucial for them to really, um, you know, um, attribute or, or assign their, uh, their, their case mix data, you know, uh, for surgical uh, services so that, um, so that we should really uh, try to, uh, Collect this information again. Now, since we have a new contractor, which is on point health health data, have vast experience with the other states, we have the confidence that we at one point could, um, could work with the peers to really um, you know, report this information correctly and without errors. So we have the so we have the confidence that that will happen. Also, um, on, on the expanding of the non people service um, expenses. But for last fall, uh, we, we did, uh, we did uh, update our regulations to uh, include not only the, uh, the Medicare, uh, the, the, the medical uh, expenses, but we expanded to include um, also is including pharmacy. And there is where we had a really, um, really spirited discussion, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the chairs, you know, uh, regarding, you know, the collection of that information. You know, uh, we, we told the commission back then, that, uh, that we would uh, learn from payers, also learn from the, the other states, how they are, are collecting this information. Um, we work with, uh, with Friedman, our, our payable, and we uh, got all that knowledge back, and came back you know, to create a, uh, a, a format to collect this information. But then after, um, what, what happened is that, uh, if you go to the, uh, what had happened is that we, um, the House Bill um, 1148 happened. But, but, but before I go to the next slide, you know, um, the alternative payment model is the format that we are going to look at today. You know, 
and also the we have a new variable uh, in the eligibility file uh, where we will, we will flag members who are attributed to uh, the various um, you know um, value based um, arrangements based on the ABCD land framework. And I'm going to talk to about that on the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so background on the on on the format. I was saying. So, uh, we we told commissioners uh, last fall that we were going to take it very slow to really have a deliberate process to um, to 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 learn from other states and um, and take that knowledge uh, to create a uh, a format and bring table uh, bring players at the table initially to really have their input and uh, and, uh, and and comments. But however. Um, House Bill 1140 that happened, which, which enables our players to provide uh, uh, and providers to engage in this address. And with that bill, 1148, MSCC is tasked, which came effective in, uh, in, in October uh, 1st, 2022, MSCC was tasked to, to, um, to answer five questions. Yeah? Of course, we were, um, reported a number of, um, of the database models, and also assess the, the quality outcomes and the cost effectiveness, effectiveness of these valid value-based models, and also to to, um, to to study the impact of this of this um, to study the, the program on the fee schedule, and last but not least, to to um, collect the number of complaints on these models, which which will be reported uh, by the by for these um. This 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 information that we will be reporting will be reported in an annual in an annual report, which will be, which the commission will report to the Senate Finance Committee, and also the House Health and Government Operations Committee, um, beginning in the, at the end of 2023, and every every uh, every year end until 2032, so long term. So um so we are required to actually um. Collect, collect information to to assess these uh, these five things. Now, now the information that uh, that that we're collecting is uh, is is quite in line, very consistent with our format ten twenty five or six, uh, which uh, which we adopted back in twenty fourteen March twenty fourteen so, uh, to uh, to collect uh, non claims based data. Next slide, please. Slide. Thank you. So, so this collection, the frequency and the framework of, of this collection. Now, this collection we will we will um, collect on an annual basis, and this is not going to be a portal submission, you know, as what we do quarterly. This is going to be annual. It's going to be pretty manual. Uh, you know, it's going to um, happen on or before the end of um, September 2023, and it's going to be um, collected in an in, in an Excel file. You know, you know, from uh, from this. Now, the framework uh, that we're using to really collect this information is uh, is the ACP plan or the health healthcare payments learning and action network and framework. And and this this framework was developed uh, by uh, by leading um, national health plans and CMS to categorize stages of APM development. So, um, so, so we are going to uh, use this uh, these um, schedules to fulfill reporting needs in order to answer those those five questions we, we talked about in the previous slide. Now, the collection of the population is going to be fully insured. That's it. Fully insured, you know, uh, for for plans at the site in Maryland, with at least uh, having a provider with at least one location in Maryland. We uh, payers are not required to report on any other population other than the insured. Other populations are totally optional. Looking at self insured or Medicare Advantage or Medicare Supplement or whatever it is, purely optional. So that means is that payers don't have to report that, they don't have to do anything, but they're required to, to report on fully insured plans. Next slide, please. So as I said before, uh, the information that we that we collect is going to be in the Excel file format, and we have these worksheets that um, that that uh, are going to publish. So the uh, I'm going to 
goes to uh, B1 and A2, the uh, financial inf information, uh, which, which, uh, which we are gonna collect from, uh, from payers. For the, for the A1 financial non-episode, uh, this will include information for, for non-episode value-based arrangements as defined in the ACB land categories A3 to C. In the A2 financial sheet, this is going to be only for episode, and this is going to be primarily for, for APC land category 4A. Now for the uh, for the quality, the quality uh, the quality report would follow. Same uh, the same categories as the financial. So for 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 non episodes, it's going to follow the same the same uh, format as for uh, for the financial. Now these these quality measures are based on uh, on EDIS on measures such as uh, breast cancer screening, the comprehensive diabetes care, follow ups after ED visits for uh, mental illness. Or risk of combined uh, epistemic use, accused authorization utilization, ED utilization, and composite cash. However, this, these are the, so these were a lot of, um, of measures that we, we have uh, pertained to, uh, to payers. However, um, they were uh, at least like 15 of them, and we actually reduced it to seven. And now this one, we are, we are even, uh, if I talk on the next slide, we are even um, having uh, two that are optional. Uh, not yet, but so so the other uh, the other uh, quality measure is for episode, which we are not going to be collecting this time around. We are not we are having a blanket waiver that, that we are not going to collect um, any any quality measure on episodes for this time around. So no information will be collected here. On the um, for the contract information. Whatever information that for for contrast is going to be um, payers going to be logged in that spreadsheet, and for the summary information that is going to include uh, information based on 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 on, uh, on Maryland residents who are who are enrolled in the fully insured and who are not attributed to HCP land categories. That means like fee for service information, and then and then the last. The last one is for notes, which would, which would include questions uh, that are asked on in the news in the notes page, and also uh, that are asked on on uh, indicated worksheets, prior worksheets. Next slide, please. So on to the the, uh, the comments from from peers. Now let me back up a bit. We had uh, we had met as by one to discuss the format of this collection, listen to all their concerns and all of the outputs, you know, and have incorporated all of the outputs and, and concerns into um, into uh, revising the uh, the template. After meeting with each um, each, each payers individually, even on the by attention, so we think that would have, would have been a good format, a good forum. So that they would not be distracted by the uh, by by the competitors, and they will be more open in, in the dialogue that, and, and hear what their concerns are. Then we bring all the payers together, as well, so that so that each payer will hear hear the competitive um, uh, carriers or payers, you know, to, to to hear what their concerns are as well. So um so so that was two forums, right? So as a result of all of those all of those. Uh, Individually and a group, then we have some of these questions and comments from uh, feedback from uh, from the peers. Well, some of the peers uh, have asked whether NSCC had the authority to even collect um, non-claims information from payers, <coughs> and, um, and we have been uh, we have had uh, this this uh, authority to collect information from since March uh, 2014. And also, we have uh, included this in the data submission manual from then up to this point. Uh, we didn't act on it, but um, but but um, because of the legislation, we uh, we uh, we have a sense of urgency to uh, to collect this information. What is that authority? I think because I was looking just to 
don't want to, I don't want to get into an argument. I, I actually honestly don't know if I have a chance to what what is the authority that in 2014? What does that say? Uh, it's, it says that the, uh, that um, that MACC has the authority to collect. Hey ben, how are you? To collect non non fee service um, um, data from uh, from patients at least for for medical expense. Okay, but it still focuses on expense. Though. I'm just trying to, like I said, as opposed to quality of care, which is right. Right. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't quality of care. So okay. was just medical expense. And um, and last four we expanded to pharmacy as well. Okay. So um so so for this, so so after after um after uh, meeting with the generally um, some of them query, um you know asked whether we have an authority with which we do, you know, and some of the players act actually um you know well, mostly all of them mm -hmm. you know, uh, have actually questioned the complexity of the database. Uh, now we um they, 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 now these complexities are, are are quite in line with what other states are doing, which I'm going to uh, talk about on the foreign sites. You know um, that complexity. Some of the players question the consistency. Uh, you know as as uh, of the approaches as to whether it deviates from from what other states are doing. Right? Some, some of the peers commented on that, um, and, and MACC um, has gone far beyond the scope of its, of its collection authority, meaning that uh, we are asking for self insured information. That is purely optional. It's only on a fully insured basis. So, 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 that is, uh, so that is not uh, accurate. And then, and then the question, the, the approach that we were actually using to, uh, to assess quality and cost effectiveness of, of, uh, of, of uh, the, what the data had to provide. The next slide, please. So, um, so what this, what this table shows, it shows, um, shows our our collection of this data template that it is not we are not doing anything different than what it is. As I said before, we have done our homework. We have met with uh, with with, with uh, we have studied what other other states are doing. Create this template, and the only difference on this on this table is the quality measure, which Maryland is the only the only state that is requiring. Uh, Payers to submit um, a quality measure, and this is this is a directive from lawmakers. You know, this is something that we have to we have to um, collect and assess. You know, um, um, for by the end of uh, 20, uh, 2020. So, so that is the only that's the only uh, difference between in what we are doing as far as uh, this temporary is concerned and what other states are doing. We are quite in line with it. No different. Complexity is the same here, as as you can see. And the only difference here is the quality measure. Next slide, please. So based on based on the peers' uh, feedback and concerns, we had made this change. We have waived the submission um, of the quality measures per episode, but collecting that this time around. No episode um, you know, uh, quality measures not doing that. Also, um, for the heat measures that we just talked about, we are uh, we are making two two of those measures optional. Of, of, of the seven, we are making two optional: cancer screening and the composite care scores. So we are listening to peers and trying to make this information you know, less burdensome. Also, um, peers. Um, for, for payers that are, are able to put in all quality measures, the CC will work with these payers to execute targeted measures. Also, some um, some payers um, said, "Well, um, we um, we don't have a um, a health status tool such, such as the ACG, uh, you know, um, a tool to uh, to calculate risk." So, so we went to the basic H. 
on gender factor, which is a long-standing, you know, tool to, to assess health standards, has been wrong forever. You know, this this Ajax factor calculation is in every carrier's underwriting area or the actual pricing. Very simply done, you could even do it by hand. Just you know, it, what, what it does, it um, it it um, it adjusts your your original population by by census factors and. Uh, that adjustment over the original give you what does what, what does and um, that is factor mm -hmm. is done by 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 whether the type of contract whether it's, it's a um, employee or only contract or employee plus child or employee plus spouse or employee plus family was that that's how that is calculated very very simple so 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 that's that's an improvement we have have actually done for here and we are requiring uh, but no um, provider billing for for fee, fee for service payment, which is from from the NCO. And also, um, we have removed uh, all of the spending for each APC land category into a single payment plan. The next slide, please. So, in summary, in summary, NSCC is required. Um, by the law to collect APM to assess the quality outcomes of the data. We, we, we need the level of detail that we are displaying in this, in this, uh, this template to really make a uh, assessment of that and also the cost effectiveness. We want to provide lawmakers with the best analysis possible. And we require we require information to, to really have, have a good report to make it meaningful to lawmakers. The notion that um, that that NSCC is collecting information beyond the scope is um is is misunderstood. It's, it's mistaken, right? We are not requiring any self-insured data at all. It's optional. They don't even have to report that at all. Amazing. We, um, except for the quality measures, this data collection is very consistent. What the other states are doing, as we see in the quality module. Now, lastly, MSCC will be will show a lot of flexibility in this data collection in this first year. We are going to meet with payers. We are going to, you know, no matter how much times, how how many time it takes to really get it correctly. You know, we are going to meet with them individually, even with a group, as many times as it takes. We are going to make sure that we get this right. Very, very, very patient. It's first, granted, it's the first, it's the first term year of connection. So we're going to be very understanding, you know, and we're going to make it right. We're going to listen to them and work with them, you know, hand in hand to really make this, to really make this be a solution. Next slide, please. So, in closing, we are asking the Commission to approve the data submission module. And upon your approval, we will display this file uh, on the Commission website. We have been having news for the upcoming subsequent um, um, period for 2023. And in January, we are going to have a training session again where we are going to. Uh, it appears one more time you know, uh, to be consistent, not only for the APM, but for the other part of the model. And for the and for the next coming months, few coming months, we are going to work with payers to make a collaborative effort to actually actually uh, make this a success. At the end of my presentation, I think. Unfortunately, Ken, I appreciate the presentation and we should discuss, but I do believe we lost our quorum, which means we, we got it back. We brought it back. Yeah. Okay. We have enough people. So, does anyone have any questions? I have a few, but I'll bring back to you. Go ahead. Of the comments you received, Ken, it, it seems to me that they're all focused on whether the quality data associated with advanced payment models is. Correct, and there haven't been any real problems collecting the financial side of it. Is that right? Because like, the concerns I have really are 
I think it's a it's a tough area and we're not just like been a lot of work so it's good on that but I have some concerns with the quality the collection of the quality data on the advanced payment models and maybe I'll say what they are and then we can talk about them I do I do have the concern that it's not within the authority of the agency because it, it may be that there's analysis but as I understand it we're hinging in the entire analysis collecting this quality data on the word aggregate in an uncodified section of the law that says at the end that we'll collect we'll aggregate and report on the following things and it seems to me that the mere inclusion of the word aggregate doesn't necessarily give us authority to delve into new types of information collection when we have some very specific statutes about collection of financial information it seems like it's a that word is doing a lot of work in the statute so i'd love to hear more about about our authority to collect quality data um, on this and second though if, if we have the authority to collect it on the mature population in Maryland, I'm concerned with how we're doing this because we we can't require these advanced payment models. We're not talking about episodic care. We're talking about like ACOs, which calculate their metrics across the whole population. That whole population are not necessarily Maryland residents and they're about half of them are different self-insured plans. And you won't know whether it's a successful plan or not if you don't have the whole picture of all the data. And, and I get the point about giving the carriers the flexibility to report just Maryland or not, probably because we can't compel them to report everywhere. But then you're going to get data that does what? It's like the quality of this little portion, and we'll evaluate whether the ACO was successful or not based on a small portion. We don't know how big of the total population. And I think that some of the carriers are rightfully concerned that that's not actually going to be a test of whether the ACO looks bad. If, if the Marylanders were somewhat different in Managed better or worse on these measures than, say, the whole 90, you know, if it's 5% and 95% is an extreme example, you might say, well, that actually those results aren't going to show you anything about the model. And we won't actually, we, I'm a little worried that you won't get usable data out of that system. And then the last one is it seems like these measures are, they, they may be good measures, but they're not the measures that the ACOs are using. It's like the signal letter was an example of. Oh, we don't use this one, we don't use this one, we don't use this one. There's a lot of measures. And these are hotly negotiated between the carriers and the large hospital systems that are doing it as to exactly what measures they think are appropriate. And it's not a matter of them just being handed down from on high by us. It's the, the hospitals have definite opinions on what measures are effective and which measures should be included, but they do differ from hospital system to hospital system and from carrier to carrier. And I don't know that requiring calculation of these particular measures is actually measuring the success of the ACOs in terms of what they're trying, the advanced payment models are trying to achieve. So that's, it's a lot of words, but it was three things. But do we have the authority? Is this data even going to measure anything because we don't know who's in, who's out? And then third is just imposing these five or, um, five or seven measures may have a look at it. I, I'm not sure why we would do that when there's a lot of measures out there on the models that we're not really competing on their terms. So. I just start off that didn't is this the only way to go or can we collect the reports from you know I think some of the carriers at least had offered to report like we will report on the outcome of our of our results every year like does it need to be this data according to our metrics that we've defined on a subset of the population do you think it's that to have we we want to uh, we want to uh, we have learned from our our uh, our states are doing this election. So, um, so we bring that, we bring that knowledge back to create this data. We, we, we didn't know. Like, like if you, so, so we, we said, okay, what, what all, what, what all this is, it, 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 this is what that, uh, that table has shown, right? So, so, so the method of these collections that we are talking about, you know, it's, other states are providing that in information, right? The only thing that they are not providing is quality measure. But with everything else, you know, um, some of some, some, some the national currency in Maryland are providing in information in other states. I think the quality, what I was asking about, what's the quality though? Don't, quality. We're, if I understood it, we're the only state that's proposing right. to go out and impose quality measures. That's where I have my concern. Like if, if this were coming up, and it didn't have the quality 
measures in the appendix, I'd be like, yep, let's, let's pass it through. It seems to me that all the discussion is about the quality measures and the collection of the quality related data as opposed to the costs. So, be wrong, if, if, I, if I could, I'm, um, so the quality measures, I mean, I think the commission has long, staff has long held the position that um, we could collect information on non claim based payments. In fact, we Hopefully not last year, uh, but the statute is pretty explicit. Uh, I think there's debate of what are the problems. There's debate on what that meant when it was passed, which you know, we have to take it as plain, plain language. But I think we have the full back position that we always were told to do that. The question is on quality. We came up with a artificial set of measures that we believe regardless of what system you're in, would be meaningful to measure. So that yes, Cigna is different than, than Aetna, is different than Care First and it's different than United. So we could have said, give us your give us your top five quality measures, but there we would have had a mush. So the, the, the instead we came up with um, acute hospital utilization. Everyone wants to cut that. Uh, Emergency department use. Everyone wants to cut that. Uh, treatment of a, a, a patient after uh, a behavioral health emergency visit, and a couple others. And we were we were upfront. We know that not every program is going to use those measures, but they are common measures that we think starting out everyone either calculates or we can calculate ourselves from the PCP. And I think the other caveat I would so, you know, the chair and others that would be certainly uncomfortable with saying in this directive that we give be flexible in the first year uh, in the data gathering because you know, when we started collecting information from payers 20 years ago, we didn't know that it would be possible. We were flexible for a lot longer than people thought we should be. And, I, and I'd say we sure can make the statement yes, we're going to be flexible. Uh, if the commission wants to tell us to be uh, flexible the first year in your direction, you know, I think you know, that's certainly acceptable. That's what we're going to do anyway. But I think flexibility in data collection the first year uh, is something that is written into the fabric of the commission. We do think quality is going to be hard to uniformly measure. And that's why we pick measures that are universally recognized state as measures that we need to back whether you're uh, operating under uh, the CMH model and ACL model um, and we're recognizing that our funded payment systems are so different we're not even asking for quality measures so that would be you know, my suggestion which is uh, are willing to activate the direct mission to be flexible in the data collection in the first year to accommodate the fact that the payers are coming from this. I mean, I would note that Oregon already has a site up where I can go to that site and see how providers are performing under a still So, with this the quality measures appendix, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I, I'm surprised that you know, carriers are not already calculating those. Those seem fairly universal and valuable to assess. And should be very easy to calculate even if they're unable to do it themselves. If they, if it's um, but I do think that there's a there's a real need out there for some some apples some vehicle for apples to apples comparison across payers providers so forth um and if just for the sake of our own state we could provide some type of consistency across payers you know, otherwise we'll never be able to compare them either characterize one versus the other are there any other commissioners that have uh thoughts comment The quality data is really going to have to be at the end of the year, isn't it? I mean, for 2023, wouldn't this be reporting in 2024? Don't you have to finish out the year before you can calculate the quality? 
Yes, yes. So we're starting in, we're starting with the, the data for 2022. We want a baseline um, in so that 2024, we have something to compare the 2024 results with. Uh, there are models in place currently um, that the insurance commissioner has told us we're very close to getting into an, a, a model that would would be permitted under a, the new legislation, but don't quite. So the first effort is to get a baseline for 2022 so that we can compare 2023 and to identify any flaws in this logic that might need to be corrected before the new models come into play. That's the purpose of this this year. And I think trying to be flexible is, is the essential part of this. The fact that we should never find a payer in 20 years of data collection. I, I don't think we could. Right. The, the quality measure, and we're allowed to collect things about the payment of medical care, right? Well, if you're not actually using the measure that is used to calculate the incentive payment, but some other measure, you could you could go into the fee for service world and say, I want to see all your quality data because it relates to the fees that were submitted for service. And I think people would say, Well, that's that's crazy. There's a bunch of individual things that happen and you want my overall data for the year for quality. Like we're kind of doing the same thing here, I feel like on the ACA, on the APM side where the hospital, is, or not necessarily a hospital, but often it is, is set up a system and they measure certain things and they get an incentive or a disincentive payment up or down based on meeting certain metrics. And then we come along and want to ask about something else. And I feel like that's putting, again, putting a lot of weight on the idea that we're supposed to aggregate data or collect things about the financial payments when it's not a piece of data about the financial payment, it's about something else that was going on to measure whether the financial payment was any good or not. And I. Well, that, I mean, we could, go, I have. we could go back and collect, you know, each, each, each payment model, each APM, we could say, report the first five, the top three quality measures. But I think we concluded that would be even more chaotic uh, because there would truly be a, a, no comparison across quality measures and, and agreeing on what I think are three common denominators, five common denominators, does seem to be maybe helpful. But I don't know that I've heard of anyone saying we're not focusing on reducing uh, acute hospital utilization. Maybe there are programs out there that are saying that's not important. But I know Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, most people want to think most of the payers are focused on reducing the patient. But if, and as I said, if they can't do it, we have two options. One, we can waive them, or two, we can calculate it. As well. So I don't think that's a, that's a, something that, that can. It's a funny word, right? And Commissioner Bozinski is going to laugh when I say that the administrative burden in health insurance is ridiculous. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's going to laugh, because, right? Because we just had it for doctors, it's, which I am sympathetic with that point, too. It, it's really a, God, probably not a can. I'm, I'm concerned with whether one, it's going to generate good data because we don't know the population set. Some are Marylanders, some are like self insured because it was voluntarily imported. Some is just a part of a, a program as opposed to the whole program. I'm not sure. I think part of this is our consumer advocacy perspective. Um, you know, there's various quality alternative payment models that come out. And what's the motivation behind them? Is it to try to, you know, Find find standards that we can easily meet and make more money, or find standards that are hard to meet, so we have to pay out less money. And do these all actually improve the health of the populations we serve? And you know, I think here as as a you know, representative, like again, that crossroads of you know payer, provider, um, and patient. You know, are the patients actually getting better health outcomes? Um, you know, through the qual through these alternative payment models, or are, they, or are these alternative payment models making doctors rich, or making hospitals rich, or making payers rich, or you know, giving patients excess care that they don't need? Um, I, I don't know. I feel I feel pretty strongly about some type of standardization across these because as somebody who interfaces with Medicare, and Medicaid, every payer under the sun, and everybody's got a different you know quality you know metrics. 
um, it seems like if quality is quality, it should be quality across whoever's on your insurance card. There should be something that's standardized. I mean, is there no, we have the claims at the end of the year. Is, is there not someone rather than having all this extra reporting that involves potentially people who aren't insured members or we don't know what fraction of the plan it is. Is there a way to use the all payer claims database if you knew who was in which programs and which providers to do an assessment? These are lump sum payments we're talking about. That's the part. Well, we I'm assuming that we would report, you know, what the carriers would report on the financial piece, right? And whatever payments were made and would provide an identification of which people were in which programs, which providers. Correct. So the missing piece is really the medical quality piece. Correct. And you know, I don't think we, um, you know, I think we realize that the quality quality measures are going to be hard. No question about that. And that's why I said we want to allow some flexibility. Uh, I find it hard to believe that you know, a payer is going to look us in the eye and say, we can't calculate you know, reductions in, in hospital utilization. Uh, uh, this is not something we care about under our payment law. Maybe, maybe there's someone out there that does. And, and we are. We have to realize we're selecting a, a proxy German sergeant. We're recognizing that some don't don't use them, but we're giving people an alternative. We'll collect, we'll calculate it. Well, and look, I, these measures are not crazy. It's just that I don't think they line up with the programs. <laughs> so, um, well, then the question is, do the programs line up with what's Tell me to be quality. Well, and I guess you would, but you need to look at the measures for those programs, which almost certainly also will not be crazy. Like that's the problem is that there's not a single set of like, well, just these six. These are the six. These are six good measures, and those are six good measures, and there's six other good measures over there. And that's, I don't think we're gonna here be able to enforce standardization of measures on this whole large industry through just reporting on the insured market, right? That's gonna be a bigger longer term issue, probably CMS will weigh in heavily on that. Um, but my concern here with the reporting is we seem to be going out, out of our out of our zone of where I think we're authorized to act and then imposing a set of standards that I don't think are gonna generate good data. But yeah, I mean remember that the measures we're we are focused on are all the measures that the state has agreed to agreed with CMM, CMMI on as statewide measures, uh, acute hospital utilization, emergency department uh, use. Uh, those are measures that, that we're focused on. The total cost of care model is, is anchored to. Uh, I, I think we've tried to pick the most generic model measures we possibly can, recognizing that it would be impossible to. Uh, to select uh, unique uh, kind of uh, boutique measures that, some, that one plan or another wants to use. We're not we're not telling plans to centralize on that. We're telling uh, plans that we're going to standardize on measures that state leadership and CMI has agreed to by and large. We're trying to do that. That's that's the goal. Of, a very limited ambition of the quality measures. And I think that it's going to be helpful for the legislature to go back and say, and I, I would think the plans would want to want to get credit for this. That yes, on measures that the state has designated as state health improvement measures, these models move the needle, or conversely, they don't. And so I I agree that you can't pick. Unique, ma unique measures for each every single plan, but we're trying to construct some measures that really represent key themes in the state's health improvement uh, effort moving forward. So that's what I, I, I mean, I think this vision might obviously I can't tell the commissioners what to do, but I think if we had some direction allow flexibility in the first year of the program, 
we would take that significant and seriously move forward. And you know, keep in mind that the payers all have waiver uh, processes that if they can't do it, they can come to us and, and say, we can't do this. Now, if payer X comes to me and says, I can't do any of this, that's not, well, that's not an answer. That's not an answer. But if they say, I can't do the quality measures, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna ask why, and we're gonna respond as we do normally. Where are we procedurally? Do we have to uh, vote on this point? Weird. Unless anybody else has any comments or questions? I don't know that we have. Uh, I think we should confirm that we have a quorum just because. I can see Commissioner Bandari. Who, who else is online? Commissioner Metz. Uh, Wood is here. Hello, Commissioner Wood? Yes. Great. Commissioner O'Grady? Yep, I'm here. Commissioner Metz, are you still on? Of course, she voted for she thought she was. Marcia, I mean, Marcia said, Marcia did say she was for this. Do we count that as a proxy vote? I'm not sure that we These people to announce on the way out the door how they would vote on it. Just approving it, right? Just approving public. Well, it just finalizes. And this is it. We do the same thing every year. Yes. This, this is the first year, however, for the this new payment model. I think if you're in person, hold your vote on account twice. <laughs> Let's see. Well, what if we can? What happens? Bring it back up. James. Oh, Joe. Undertake a two minute break. Say Get someone online. Do they can they vote by audio only or is it by <laughs> visual vote? That's in the discretion of the uh, consent. <laughs> the discretion. <laughs> Over there. Well, Grady's back. Michael Grady's Very blue, good. but he's back. Cool lighting. But yeah, yeah. Some some technical difficulty. Keep getting dropped off, but I I'm here. And just keep dialing back in. Oh, thanks, man. You know, if you just had to attend by audio only, you'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Your point is well taken. Yeah, <laughs> next month. Oh, more more that commissioners job. are coming in. I'm, I'm like moving farther away. You don't even see me on video anymore. I'm just gone. <laughs> Oh, see, your video is blurred. Even even if I have to do televisit, I may not be able to see what you're trying to say. <laughs> is, uh, are we sure their votes are real or are they fraudulent and abusive? Yeah, I don't know. Not abuse. Not abuse. <laughs> um, that's a thing. You penalize. 95% who follow the law because of the 5% who are going to abuse the system. Yep. The tail wagging the dog, or are we doing the right thing to curtail those abuses? Yeah. Moving for Commissioner Metz. High drama. High drama. Mm. Are you sure, Wood, you're still on? Who are you talking yes, about? Yes, I'm, I'm here. We do we need? You're not counting uh, Commissioner Boyle's proxy vote before she left. I think it has to be a little more formal than the proxy vote tonight. That's on me. I'm a lawyer. I should have asked her to put it in writing. I'm late for I'm hanging. I was hanging on just because I wanted to make sure we had a quorum. 
Is this the last agenda? Yeah, the last agenda. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's been a long meeting. I appreciate everyone's case. Unless you have a pressing need for a home STD kit. Case you're just gonna hang on, on, on the agenda. Hey, hang, on. hang on for another month. Yeah. Hey, Commissioner Metz. Hey, he's on. He's the Lord. Sorry about that. I had to leave for I had to leave for another meeting, but not the only one. No blame. We just need a vote. We just missed you. It's all good. So we got it. Here's my we'll call for a motion. Here's my question you mentioned flexibility. Because none of this reporting is going to take place until next year. The, the uh, baseline year, baseline year, yes. But the right, but the on the quality stuff, you go to the end of the year and then you calculate what to report. So to report on 2023, no. you'll have to report in 2024. Right. So we're more than a year out from when the well, measures. What, I, what I'd like to know is the flexibility includes working with the industry and I include the providers there as well because I think they have some concerns also with whether there's some agreement on the least at one. Well, I think, I mean, I think flexibility is in the eye of the beholder. You know, this, this is really important to start this year because in 2023, the legislature is going to want to report and we're going to guarantee it's crap if that the first attempt. We have to, we have to try this year to iron out some of the kinks in this entire process. And I think, to, to, you know, to the payers' perspective, it's what don't they really like? Some of the payers have have confirmed that they're doing the same thing, except not reporting quality measures. Two or three other states. Um, you just have to work through some of these kinks. I think what I suggested, to, if there's concern, to say we are release, we are we are authorizing the publication and direct the staff to show flexibility in the first year of data collection to reflect you know challenges that the particular payer uh, may encounter in, in these attempts. I make a motion to that effect. Second. Second. We have Commissioner Brzezinski and seconded by Commissioner Wang. Okay, is there any discussion? We discussed it quite a bit. Anybody else? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'll abstain. Good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, All right. So we have. An overview of upcoming activities. Yeah, anyone has the heart. First, I want to just thank everyone for uh, sticking with us. I will send out a list of member agenda. Looks like got a lot of conflict at this meeting, so hopefully we can try to get at a reasonable hour in December. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, we knew it was going to be a busy day, uh, but not quite as long. I'm sorry. So safe travels, everyone. Uh, what are these, that's the name. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye bye. Thank you. Here's what I get. Here's the discussion. Uh, very spirited. Uh, spirited.